The Vicarcova Reasons in North America The Beautiful by Ben Luneda Art by Georg J.U.T.V.A.L.L. 1-2 Chapter 1 Clint was sitting in the back of an almost empty Greyhound bus. He was leaving his small town provincial village, which was made up of a series of rectangles placed around interconnecting roads in an almost barren desert environment, lacking features such as cactuses and mountains and those enclosed rocky areas in which cowboys camp and fake sets in the Hollywood films. Clint was leaving his small town where he had grown up, his small town where he had thought to himself that he had become a man, a small town where he was educated and bred and assumed up until this moment that he would die. Clint was leaving this small town and he was on this Greyhound bus heading towards Los Angeles, L.A. He was heading in this direction because he wanted to become an actor a famous actor. So he wanted to find truth and act in films and wear costumes and have expensive watches in a box, in a cupboard that he would slide out. And with the help of his beautiful wife, choose which watch best fit the situation and then picking one after long over a deliberated session of stylization of watch faces. Clint wasn't there, yeah. It might never be, though, in his heart of hearts. Clint knew that he would be there soon enough. But at this particular moment in time, he was sitting on a Greyhound bus. Clinton began rehearsing lines in his head. He had no parts. He had never acted. He'd never talked to an actor. We've seen one apart from all those humming, vibrating screens, the door and all the walls in his house. Three and the more. Expressive chemical malaise of the movie theater. The lone movie theater in town. Blasting images of faces the size of skyscrapers into the clouds of the auditorium, two sheets of plastic embedded with colored chemicals, Clint's summation of the medium. He was about to join with only as a passive viewer. He summarized at this point that people got together and were picked out of some line or book based on facial features and height and sex and age and penis length and were sorted into productions and the best of these productions were picked every year. And these were shown across the country. And these were the films that Clint had seen. Clinton didn't have much with him on the bus. We hit a brown leather jacket, worn, damaged, and with a cloth, plastic heath, frilly color sleeves, and waistband, which refrain and crystallizing into a hot estilo form of fabric. The windows in the bus were open and the mixture between air pressure, heat speed and the elation of leaving the town. He was born this bus to feel more beautiful than anything he had ever seen. Based on a late night interview, he knew the actors compartmentalized emotion into small vials. These vials could be drunk at any time. I would transport the actor back to that moment of their lives and they could re-experience the quality of that situation without the specific context. Clint Rudimentary really tried to file this sensation. Ecstasy, orgasm. Peace, quiet, serenity, freedom. Heat, joy, hope, death, transcendence. Wasn't particularly happy in the small town where he was born. The buildings were not only shaped like shoeboxes, but they were arranged like shoeboxes. Clint would walk from block to block. He would be driven. He would drive. He would go to small concerts put on by provincial bands. It would surely be having sex with hand-picked virgins from the audience when those types of t-shirts are cut just above the T.E. circumflex T.E. Clinton didn't have much money. He was leaving his small town where he was born with basically nothing. It wasn't basically nothing. He already had something invaluable, something that no one else ever had. He had this experience right now. He had the feeling of this hot bus and the bellowing air for and the pressure. Not quite equalizing and battering it baffling the hot air from outside the bus with even hotter air inside. Clinton leaned against the window. $127 in his pocket. This money was earned from his small beginnings, an employment that he had began before realizing that life. What's going to be so immeasurably disappointing? He would rather. D than working customer service. The bus wasn't filled with characters on their own story or people passing by or other actors or a beautiful girl. It was filled with scum. It was filled with people like Clint Retards. 
rejects idiots, morons, people that were too broke to afford a better bus ticket or their own car, people that were so incompetent that they didn't have anyone that loved them, that they could barely keep a job at a gas station, men and women that had done depraved sexual things with each other for fun, first for cash or drugs or a place to stay, and then eventually, as a sort of antidote to the reality of living in a skin as dumb, such dark things. The bus has got to stop soon. Stop by a gas station. People could get out and shit and smoke. When they did stop, people got out and shit and smoke. Clean Hope Town. This was the first time he'd ever stepped foot outside of his town. It was an ally yet, but it would be seen. This was all a lie to him. Clint walked inside the gas station and purchased a can of Coca-Cola. The cam was perfectly cold, perfectly aluminum, perfectly marketed, perfectly printed, perfectly sweet, and Clint cracked it open and it sounded like it and Clint felt like an ad. Clint walked back to his car and realized it wasn't a cop at a bus. It was a Greyhound bus, and he now had $125 in his pocket and he was leaving his hometown. And soon, this reality, this life he was living, these experiences would just be fodder for think tanks on late night talk shows. Five there'll be fodder for dinner parties, and snapped conversation around a glass top table covered in a white crystalline powder that would soon dominate not only Clinton's life but the entire western world's concept of God, economy, justice, philosophy and love. Clint sat back in the bus. The other degenerate snuck back in. Like a boy is dormant training for a fire drill. Meeting. Benjamin Franklin, an autobiography. Chapter 2. It wasn't uncommon in the days of Benjamin Franklin to be killed suddenly and for no reason. It was almost an inevitability. People were shot over stealing cabbages and horses and loves. The courts were not only for the rich, but for the rich that weren't willing just to have you killed. They also wanted your children to be in poverty and a wife to be fucked while you are in prison for being too poor. Benjamin Franklin is a foundational American figure, and any understanding of the events of this story require at least a preliminary understanding of the life and times of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was born in a small village. There was no Greyhound bus outfit. He worked in his small village. It would soon become the king of his small village. The other villages also had Benjamin Franklins. The ones to the north wanted to keep human beings as a type of machinery, like a tractor or a vibrating builder. The other, Benjamin Franklin, thought that human beings were sacred even though they functioned identically to tractors and vibrating builders that they needed to be treated more like a pet or an owl six than a piece of machinery. The two camps of Benjamin Franklin's formed. This time in America, that was a contingency of British troops. This was because the entire country was run by Britain who was being used to produce cotton and oil, and to annoy the French and the Spanish, who also wanted the cotton and the oil of the Americas. Unfortunately for both the French and the Spanish, the British pretty much had it locked down. But some of the Benjamin Franklin ads on both sides thought that the English weren't really up to the job of harvesting oil and cotton from America. They thought they could do a better job themselves if only they were given the chance. They did several aggressive things to the British and drove them off. Their relationship with the English would always stay sweet and polite and kind because they were both playing the same game. They were both just people and they collided. And they fought and they killed each other. But they could fall in love again. They could do impossible things together. They were just animals, after all. They were more like pigs than the watches they wore on their wrists. And they knew that deep down every time they saw each other or shook hands. After the Americans drove off the British, they then began cannibalizing each other. The small differences, which seemed very insignificant when they were under the totalitarian hellish hit, Larry and Nazi dictatorship of the English began to blossom into massive divides. Small questions such as if men were closely related to pigs or wristwatches, caused men to stand in fields in long, long lines and shoot each other with troops firing small, 
rotund metal slugs at each other. Eventually, after lots of people died, Benjamin Franklin signed the Declaration of Independence, which meant that a man could wear a watch on his wrist, but only if he had sex with a pig. There are other laws drawn into place. Freedom, integrity, love, life, justice, power, and a new type of governmental branch called Gongd. It seven would oversee the beating of every child's heart to make people live forever in a garden of infinite giving and kindness. During Clinton's time, this department would be in overtime. It'll be working so hard. It would be like a hummingbird's wings, too frantic to be certain that they're even there, that the bird isn't levitating. Clint, like all Americans, didn't quite know this story. They knew the signifiers. They knew the events, but they didn't know the details. They didn't know the topology of Gwyneth Paltrow has back. As a stubbled, acquired by a boy traced the crevasses down to therm buttocks and crisp, white flowing blood spreadsheets. Americans knew that Plymouth Rock existed and was not some type of pun. They knew that the pilgrims landed on the moon. But exactly what that rock was. Where it was. What Plymouth was. What a person afoot was. Oh, how anyone could ever arrive somewhere and build a nation and a people from standing on a rock was not only unknown, but completely forgotten. And if you claim to know or remember one of these fables in the past, people would look at you funny. They would whisper. They would call you names. They would enter you into ledges. You you'd be prosecuted. Chapter 3. Bus Stations. Clint arrived at the Hollywood bus station. The facility was huge, huge, huge. Panes of bent glass were supported by a rib cage of reinforced bolted steel. The Goliath structure stood in the middle of very flat ground, flat ground with buildings stacked on top of it. It felt very temporary. Clint's hometown felt very temporary, too, but it had stayed there. It was just plasterboard and word, but it had stayed there. Nothing blew it down. Nothing crashed. And no drunk lorry driver accidentally destroyed the village one night while sleeping at the wheel. Eight had stayed there for generations. And even when this book, Brown Ashes, that town will most probably still be there. Its billboards and street lamps. In a permanent state of precarious non-existence, the bus station smelled like human shit. It stunk of human shit. No one seemed to notice. Clinton noticed, but acted like he didn't notice. The particle, the shit, and hit his nose and his eyes. Arrested at the corners of his mouth, impregnated his clothes as he walked out to the bus station into the baking hot. Locked outside, the inmates of the bus scattered. They all had nowhere to go particularly. And how to get there before is quite dark and the hunting parties would set out. Chasing down the most bedraggled Hollywood well-wishers. Clinton knew that he hadn't taken enough money with her. He could barely afford a motel for the night. He could barely afford a car. Who? Kohler every day for the rest of his life. He needed his big break and he needed it now. And by God, he had worked for it, hasn't he? He had sat on that bus all that time and he had cashed away the feeling of hot air in a hot bus rippling against his face. Clinton walked across the lot, which were still thumping with the heat of the captured sun earlier that day. He could see the glimmerings of a motel, a place to rent a room and sleep base of operations for his new life. Clint spent his money on his resume. Nine twenty-five dollars a night. Got his room key. From the creature behind the desk opened his door, which didn't creak or make a single sound and enter the surrounding motel rooms were exploding with constant noise. The screams of rape, of TV blaring, of drug busts, of drug deals, of parties, of strippers coming home to discover that childhood overdosed on narcotics that she had accidentally left out. The child had mistaken for handing. Clint lay down in the bed, which was hard and covered in bugs, too microscopic to be seen as a human eye. He slept, he dreamed of when he was a child. The furthest he'd been out of his town was during a hunting trip with his father and his brother. They were deep in the desert. 
It felt deep. It felt prehistoric. It felt prolific. Nothing could surprise. They were with other men and boys. All the men and boys were related. By ejaculate and eggs, the hunting trip was an excuse for men to drink with each other and boys to boast about their father's drinking. Huntsmanship girls at school and their proclivities to have larger genitals than other boys. Clint's father was drunk. Clint was drunk and Clint's brother was also drunk. Everyone was drunk. The children weren't drunk when it was so late. The stars in the sky spelled out 12.30. The men began shooting. They began shooting bottles they had previously emptied. They began shooting cans. They were finishing as they show. They shot hats off of trees and then Clinton's father shot his brother. There were a series of cars parked in a semicircle. These cars had big spaces at their backs where farmers could store equipment and landowners could plant pieces of misbehaving trees that were somehow interfering or violating the spaces of humans that wanted to live around trees but not have them interact with them in such a interpersonal. No way. The headlights were on their engines. Some of them were gurgling away, sipping their big cans of fuel to pump light across the desert plain. The bullet entered Clint Brothers head. Clint 10 could see this. Kent's father could see this. No one had reacted. The bullet went through the head, went through the skull, went through the back of the nose, through the brain. And a thick tube of blood. Extruded after the boy's head out of the hole. The tube was lit up. Like blood in a football game. With the floodlights capturing a surreal photograph of a boy with a tube of red blood shooting. Pouring out of it, brother's head. Clint's father broke down instantly. He knew that he had done one of the worst things a father can do, shooting his child accidentally in the head while drunk in the desert. The drunk men began moving to attention and action. None of them were military men. But you could have sworn in that moment that they all believed that they could have shot Saddam Hussein themselves with their lethal attention to detail and military precision in their drunken actions. They started moving towards cars, organizing boys, drinking while running, playing fuck, fuck, fuck. Zane went to retrieve their own children that they had not killed. Clint watched his father wailing, watched his father spitting and squealing and trying to shake Clint's brother awake. But there were just more bubbles of red. Figure out who Clint's poor brother's head. His eyes were still open, and Clint could see them glistening wetly in the light from the surrounding cars. Clint awoke after the dream. It wasn't quite a dream. It was a nightmare. During became a memory, Clint went from seeing the phantasm firsthand to remembering the firsthand Hassan firsthand. He could tell that the blood had left his brother's head and somehow this has caused his brother to die. And death was the act of a soul no longer inhabiting an animal. And then it was terrible and inevitable, and it could happen for no reason. And the consequences for the person it was happening to were far less than the people around them. Clint author remembered how his father acted, not only in those seconds of crippling remorse and regret so deep that he would vomit later, but how he acted a year later, how he looked at bare cans, how he smiled less, how he watched the TV and his eyes 11D focused, staring over it long over. Miles over to the desert to where there were prehistoric cactuses and boys shooting tubes of blood in almost perfect darkness with headlights refracting perfect blood from a perfect body frozen in time and inaction caused by muscly string-like fibers in Clint's father's hand. Clint didn't know if he should shave or not. Clint didn't know if he should get out of bed or not or if he should stop breathing or go next door to where there seemed to be an underdog ground dog fighting ring setting up and see if he could defeat the pit bull himself. Or maybe he should bet the rest of his money on the fight. Maybe he should go upstairs and see if the southern prostitute will take him for much less than her new usual fee, since she had an exotic new type of virus that she was only just discovering would cause the remaining years of her life to be short, agonizing, and separated from other humans. By the sheer terror of the lethal shit in her blood, Clint passed, instead, 
The Coca-Cola from the coach ride didn't seem to break down in his stomach or his balls with kidneys or whatever causes liquid to be turned into pears. There seemed to be colorless liquid and then thick dark. Coagulant pumped out. Didn't have anything to shave his face or anything to wash his hair or his body. So he just stood in the shower for a while. Then turned it off, then stood in the shower while waiting for his body to somehow become dry in an impossible ritual with nature or physics or whatever makes your body dry. Officer, you've had to shower. In a bug-infested motel room in Hollywood, Los Angeles, Clint put on the same clothes they had worn the day before. These were his only clothes. He left his motel room and returned the key at the front desk. There was someone else there today. The person at the desk looked at Clint. Like he was a fascist dog. Covered in shit, smearing himself on a newborn baby. The disgust was beyond empathy is beyond reality. How is the reason? The man behind the desk said fine, said Clint, absolutely fine. Twelve Clinton left. The modicum of cool caused by a fan in the ceiling. Drunkenly buffering air around the room vanished and Clint was outside again, but outside again for the first time, this new place. Clinton knew that he maybe had three days before he would die here. He would still be alive, but he wouldn't be a person anymore. There weren't homeless like there were in Los Angeles, California, where Clint was from. But there were people like homeless people. There were drug addicts and pornographers, addicts that drifted outside of the realm of societal understanding and formed a new culture, a culture that traded something other than money for something other than goods and services, that developed new languages and pursuits and passions. And once you were gone, you could never come back. You can have a haircut or brush your teeth or wear a suit. There was something chemical changed in your body. That would mean other humans could smell that you weren't one of them that you didn't belong in that pack, that you'd crossed a river. You had worms that you had dangerous. Clinton knew that if he was in Los Angeles for three days and didn't become a movie star, he would become one of those people. And in some ways, he was ready to embrace them. Clement began to stroll. He purposely avoided walking. He wanted to look like he had purpose, that he belonged here in case a movie executive was watching. Across the street, you know, Deb and I pout and voyage along a boulevard he passed. Stores with amazing things in them. I saw people dressed immaculately in tartan and flannel. Clint had no idea where he needed to go to find the people that controlled the universe. He hoped he would find them soon. After hours of wandering, Clint's feet were tired. It's back and he had the beginnings of some slightly on one side of his face as he had been walking one direction and the sun 13 had been beating down upon him mercilessly throughout the day. Black Chevy car pulled up beside Clint. Clinton had a good feeling about this. He was right. Hey, are you new in town? Said a voice. I'm inside the car. Clint turned pivoting on his left foot exuberantly. Yeah, I'm new in town replied Clint, smiling. Great. Well, I'm looking for talent for a project I'm beginning. I just saw you walking along the street and you definitely have something unique about you. Do you have an agent yet? No, I don't have an agent in. Well, how about that? You augering. The voice from inside the car. Uttered. Clinton crouched down, slyly hunched. The person inside the car into the air, he was wearing a black suit with a black tie and black sunglasses. Hi, I'm Clint. Clint said, that's a good name, Clint, I can tell you what. You look tired. You want to go to a diner and I can talk to you about this role I have in mind for you. Clinton says, fantastic. I would love to go to a diner with you. I'm tired of my feet. Clint opens the door and gets in. It's baking outside the cool and the car. The man at the wheel smiles at Clinton. Hi, Clinton. My name's Alan Barry. I'm with the FBI and you've just been recruited. Clint was shocked. The FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigations. 
recruiting him. A guy from small town America. What were the odds? Clint smiled and said, Great pleasure meeting you. The FBI agent, Barry, told Clinton that there were secret wires around town that he wanted Clint to find for him. And they weren't going to a diner after all. They needed to find these wires really soon. Well, something bad was gonna happen. And the agent himself couldn't touch the wires. He needed someone else. Someone knew someone green to do it for him. The FBI agent drove at a steady speed. He had a big gulp cup, a white plastic tablet of melting ice chips. Glucose. He never drank from. Slowly turning car temp as they drove down and thus 14 blocks in the flat city. They're right there. They were in a poor part of town, a problem area, a place where the houses kind of looked provincial. But in the sort of way that they do at an amusement park right there. Didn't you see Clint? What am I looking at there? Right there. Clint Wall. Why is there's wires hanging down right there? I need those wires and I can't touch them. I told you this, Clint. I need someone green. There was a bundle of cables by the side of the road. It looked like a construction worker or someone installing. Telecommunications in the house had left it out as I went inside to get something. Clint, I told you, you're one of us. You're a fucking spook. Pick it up. I need your green. Clint opened the car door before making his mind up. He paused for a second with the door hanging open. His feet still inside the car. And he looked back over at the FBI agent who is now removing the big gulp. From the cup holder in the central section of the car. Go quickly before he comes back. I need the wire. I need that wire. Clint. Clinton stepped out. He was slightly afraid that the FBI agent would drive away. He knew that there was a bond between FBI agents and that he was part of them. He would never be alone. It would never be empty. It would never be abandoned by them. They were his brothers. Clint now. Clint stepped out. His natural reaction was to emit a noise of satisfaction and relief from exiting the not-so-cramped car enclosure. Back into the outside world, he contained this urge, a move towards the bundle of cable. Clint didn't know what was special about this cable. He was just happy to be on the job, to have made it. Finally in Los Angeles, California, to be getting this cable for the FBI that she was now a proud part of the cable was quite heavy. It wasn't telecommunications cable. It was more like a winch cable. Why something for sailing? Clinton never seen the ocean or being swimming in anything other than a small chlorinated pool. With other white, 15 freckled children, planes began returning to the car with a cable held in front of him. His name is banging into it. It was heavier than he thought it would be, his agent, his best friend, beckoned Clint towards it in the back. Put it in the back. Clint, did it move by the driver's side, popped to the boot, open and stuck the cable in the trunk. The trunk was completely empty, apart from the cable. The car, apart from the big gulp, was completely empty, completely new, completely untouched. The trunk slammed shut. Clinton got in the passenger seat and they drove off. There was no sense of elation, a small sense that they had survived something and experienced something together. They were bonded for life over this one indecent act. Yeah, Clint, that was good, man. That's real good. I was worried. I was worried that you weren't green. You were telling me stories. You saw I would pick you up off the street. Almost done here. There's only two things left, Clinton. I need you to do. You need to help me out with this cable. And then, I need to drop you off somewhere. And you need to say something to someone for me, okay? Like a mission, like a code word, clean. Yeah, Clinton, are you okay? You did good back there. I'm really proud of you, Clinton. Thank you. Clinton replied, I really I. I didn't know if it's gonna be hard or difficult. But it was. You know, the cable was quite light, so it really wasn't a problem. 
Yeah. The FBI agent replied, Yeah, you did good. Banner. Plane continued driving with the FBI agent. They do what he got that cable and completed their first mission. And Clint was feeling pretty good about his new role in life, helping the American government and being green. The back of his head. He wondered what would happen when he wasn't green. B.E. thought that would be somewhere else to go and expand his career in 16 the FBI. Maybe picking up people who were green rather than picking up the cable. The FBI agent was beginning to be less cool. He was signaling more wildly and breaking harder and seemed to be in slightly more of a state than he was earlier. He was looking for something whipping his head back and forth. Clint asked what was up. Feeling okay? Yeah, yeah. The FBI agent replied, yeah, yeah. After a couple of minutes, Clint became bored and asked to turn the radio on. The FBI agent said, Yeah, but I don't think you'll like him and hit the button on the dash that turned the radio on a loud voice clipped into focus. It was talking mainly about heat and plants and maybe his wife bed. And then something else faded over it. Some more talking. Beep death. FBI agent beep his home and the radio replied, One asshole. Clint looked a bit confused. The FBI agent was loving this. Oh, yeah. This guy is green. He thought to himself. Yeah, the radio here. It just is local radio. So it's whatever people are thinking around us. FBI agents don't get music too distracting. 170, Clinton replied. That's weird. We didn't have radio like that back in town. FBI agent smirked. God. This kid was scream pickle fucking green. Okay. Well. We've got we've got to drop something off ish. I guess you could say that and then I've got to drop you off. Yeah, Clint was happy with this eight loof instructions for the rest of the day. Yeah, great. He replied, cool. So it's just up here. The FBI agent was driving down a slightly more off the road and then swerved off of it sharply off of this green bank, then down some concrete. Then suddenly he was next to the L.A. River, which is more of a trickle, which was more like the back of a toilet, where sometimes there's rivulets of water after you flush shit. This is it, L.A. River. Ever seen anything as beautiful? The FBI agent smirked. Clint smiled back. Hmm. Smells. Clint replied, it's just up ahead, said the agent. Continuing to drive a stately play pace. See that bridge there? Yeah, well, I need you to put the cable through one of those alerts up there and then tie it off. Okay. How am I supposed to get up there? Said Clinton. You're going to have to stand on the car, said the agent. Fine. Sure, I can do that. Cool. So Clinton beginning to imagine the process in his head and the feasibility of it and the lunacy of it, but also happy to have a task and be useful to someone. The car stopped under the bridge, the alert was visible. Clint popped out, opened the trunk, grabbed the cable, stood on the back of the car and threaded the cable through the island and tied it off. Clem only knew one knot. He tied that same note that everyone ties the same way you tie shoelaces. And tied a... It was... An ugly contraption, and Clint couldn't really figure out what it was supposed to be doing up there. Well, it was his job. He was an FBI agent. Now Clint jumped down off the car slightly over-dramatizing the action. He was in Hollywood after all. And he didn't know who was watching. He went round to the driver's side of the car, holding the cable in his right hand on the hand, smiled at the FBI agent, 18 picked him up and loved him because he was green and given him his first work in the fat city. The FBI agent rolled his window down. It was electric. It purred. And squeaked as it retracted. Great now, because after we do this, I'm not the way to speak for a bit. So do you have any questions? Real quick, I guess, Clint Gale I and thought about it for a second. Yeah, but, um, what's my role in the FBI? Am I, like, officially recruited now?
The driver looked a bit confused. No, I thought you you to be as a stallion, my client. Clint looked puzzled. The FBI agent began explaining there had been a humorous misunderstanding between Clint and the FBI agent. FBI was a talent agency. Clint wasn't working for the federal government, was instead working for a federally owned talent agency called the FBI. The FBI was an intergovernmental body charged with defending American rights by killing people, faking news media and events, and raping and killing children across the world. They chuckled at the misunderstanding, and Clinton was presently surprised. Most misunderstandings result in something negative, but this one was quite a positive turn of events. The FBI agent instructed Clem on how to tie the rope around his neck. He wanted the cable to be as tight as possible and to be connected to the eyelet on the bridge and around his neck. Clint did so. The FBI agent looked quite encouraged by this and Colin 19 walked round to the other side of the car where the passenger seat was and got in. The agent accelerated the car, took off the automatic gearbox, switched gears automatically, and a cable that was attached to the eyelet, which will attach the bridge, which was attached to the FBI agent neck, went from being a flaccid snake-leg protuberance to an incredibly taut, bright tube connecting the agent snake to the bridge. In perfect symmetry in fourth, the cable sliced through his neck instantly. Clint's knots held, which was quite surprising. Clint, as he only knew one type of knot the agent's head span off and his neck hole began pumping blood in a precocious fine mist, which didn't last very long. The car began lifting up the side of the L.A. River. Clint thought about touching the whale, but didn't the gears change down? And the car began to pull off from the riverbank and the agent turned the radio back on and tuned it to be internal into the car. Yeah, that was great, Clint. Great job. Good. Not. Clint smiled and sheepishly replied that he only knew one not so. He was pretty glad that it managed to hold. The agent replied they would have been pretty awful if it didn't work all the way and they had to redo it. Lots of people have to redo this type of thing for it to work. Clint could see how that would have been quite a kerfuffle and was glad it was over now and that here needs to be dropped off. Or the last thing that the FBI agent said, whatever that was, it was quite forgetful. Especially since he had just assisted suicide and seen a third dead body in his short life. The car pulled onto the highway. Go into the hills now. Big changes ahead for you in your life. The radio crackled in the agent's voice. With the slight overdubbing of other passengers and cars and drivers as they sped past him on the highway. Go into the hills now, crackled the radio, go into the hills. Clint smiled and looked out the window. Twenty wow, this place is beautiful. Big highway. Clinton looked over at the hellish Asian. Seemed quite happy driving the car. Oh, yeah. He thought, I've made it. Clint and the FBI agent ripped down the highway towards the hills. They had been heading for for quite a while. The traffic was present. It didn't impact their journeys home. They felt weightless. And Clint, even though he had been in a bus for the previous two days, felt refreshed by this journey, by the energy of his headless companion who had gone from a panicked, competitive, zealous agent to a voice on the radio that groomed and blended in with a thousand other nameless voices swirling around him as they sped down an endless Namus highway towards the hills. Well, K-L-I-N, it's been a pleasure doing business with you. I'll give you my card. They're actually reprinting them here at the shop at the moment because I got my name wrong. They misspelled in, and I guess I had a headshot on the back, which might need to change now. He he said the Asian. Well, my plan is to drop you off with someone. He's kind of expecting you, I think. Yeah, I guess he is expecting you. Okay, said Clinton. Clinton was quite content. He felt warm. He was warm. The air conditioning was battling the thundering heat from outside. It pulled up to the house in the hills. Grain fed the agent. Thank you, Clint, 
I might be seeing you around sooner rather than later. See you soon, ma'am. Oh, yeah. By the way, tell the guy you're here to fix the cable. 21 okay. Remember the cable? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Well, ask Glenn. FBI agent looked a bit distressed. I think I left my head in the LA River. I'm gonna need that. Clint asked if he the agent wanted him to come back with him and he would help him look. The agent declined the offer. Flynn had the idea that he was smiling, but he couldn't see because his head was severed and was currently in the LA River. See you plane, see you around, say, see you sooner than later. The radio barked again. Clint reciprocated the warm goodbye. See you around. Hope to see you soon. Was a pleasure working with you. Clint stood out of the car standing up. He didn't internalize the orgasmic moan of exiting a motor vehicle this time and stretch languorously. He looked around him for the first time. He was on a mountainside. Below him was a fuzzy, low-resolution version of Los Angeles. When cars breathe out, they breathe out. Water. Smoke and fuzz. This fuzz was lying thick over the tossing and turning. Los Angeles below him. It was midday, high noon, and he was standing outside of a huge mountaintop mansion. Clinton walked to the gate and saw a small electronic buzzer with WGW, which have another clip. Hit the bell exuberantly. Things are going well. Things were going well. The buzzer rang. Clint could hear the fading FBI agent's car humming down the road as it drifted off back into the dream of the city below him. The city seemed less flat from up here. It seemed more rhythmic. It looked like a sound signature or marks. Hello. A voice. From the box attached to the door in front of the mansion is the... It's Clint. I just got dropped off. I'm not expecting you. The voice replied, Oh, I'm the cable guy and the guy to fix the cable. Clint said with an internal wink to the sly nature of the FBI agent who had so ingratiated himself with Clinton earlier that day, the first guy he had ever met from outside his town. Clint realized. The doors opened, the gate swung apart. Sign that previously muted sounds of birds, harmonicas and radiance clambered through the now open gates. Come on up. The voice said over the intercom. Come on 22 out. Cleared to read. It's time to come on out, he said. Yes, said the voice over the interface. We'll be waiting for you up here. Clint moved towards the gate and moved through at. Now, who is outside? who was feeling hot and slung his jacket under his arm, underneath his jacket. He was wearing a t-shirt, the t-shirt and big black letters and then a picture of a falcon. The t-shirt said American Falcon. Fuck, yeah. Clinton had earned the t-shirt for many years, and had the same affection for it as you would an old towel. Or witnessing your neighbor's discarded slippers. It was precious because of its proximity to him. The open gates were revealed, but the generic mansion was generic. It was a gloss to a fixed on the hill in Los Angeles. It would surely contain a member of the Gotu Ranching, a well-polished, probably shaven, maybe ethnic individual who had a TV show or a licensing deal or sold blood or pills or ran a computer company, but wants to be near the glitz, glamour and child prostitution of Hollywood. Clint was excited by all of these possibilities. He was ready to go inside. His experience with the FBI agent was enough of an encouragement to think that not only did he belong here, but he was already doing pretty well for himself. Considering that he only had one powerful actor's emotion to draw from, that was the heat from inside. The Greyhound bus on the way to 23 Hollywood. Less than two days ago. Clint approached the glass tube and could see a man standing silhouetted that lit from the front as well. Man was wearing shorts, a flannel shirt cut off the arms, holding a glass, which was shorter than most glasses containing a yellowish liquid. Clint smiled as he approached the house. The man inside didn't man inside look semis, suspicious, but welcoming. The glass door swung open and Clint was about to meet.
and then that would change the course of his entire life so dramatically that it would be impossible to identify him after this short conversation. That's the man who arrived on a Greyhound bus not two days ago to go to. I hope they sent a Christian. The man who is silhouetted, apart from his features said to Clint as he walked up the path, Well, replied Clint, stopping as he walked. Nothing. It was just a joke, says the guy in the tube on top of the mountain in Los Angeles, California. Clint smiles there. He doubts that this facial tick will telegraph that difference. Clint says Clint IMAX applies the figure now. Max. I'm Max. So you're the cable guy, says Max. Yeah, I am. As Clinton well, I was too old to slam the cable guy. So I guess that makes me the cable guy in there. So I'm here to fix your cable, in which case I'm in, which helps if you're expecting a cable guy to fix your cable. That wasn't me. Max looks slightly taken aback, but not at all shaken by the confusing dirge of words produced by Clint. No problem to all any cable guys, a cable guy to me, man. So, Clint approaches the door. He is now almost face to face with Max. So, Clint, it's a pleasure to meet you. They shake hands. Clint, I got a question for you. Come with me. Max turns on his heel and begins walking at a sultry pace across the Polish concrete of his LA tube home. Clint. Beautiful home you have here, Max, beautiful. Max, my father used to live in a shoebox with me and my five siblings. Now I live in a tube all by myself. Life sure is funny. Sometimes, Clint responds. Yeah, life sure is funny. Just two days ago, I was on a Greyhound bus. Now I'm in 24, your massive tube home. Funny how things changed so fast, Max, and as he walks, looking back at Clint, you were on a Greyhound bus the other day. Damn you, Al Green. Yeah, people keep telling me that. Not entirely too sure what it means, says Clint. Max is continuing to look behind him as he walks across the polished concrete floors, walls of his huge LA home suspended on a hilltop in Los Angeles, California. It just means the green that you haven't done growing, that you're not a tree, that you're not planted in place. That if anyone wanted to, they could rip you up, could throw you to one side, your sapling, the grass sap, that a sucker. You don't have your own tube. You don't have this a tube like me. Maybe you will one day, I guess saying no green implies you can grow. At least you're not black. Well, you know. Not black, but you know what I mean. Not you're not. But I'm done growing a Ralston or green. I guess you are green, you know, but I'm in a better way than saying, you know what I mean. Well, maybe you don't normally more put together than this. I think today's day is complicated. I'll show you why. Clint follows Max into the largest almost atrium-like sitting room of the tube home. Now. This is the problem. In the middle of the floor, it's a smashed coffee table made of glass. Above it is a semi-height balcony with a table presumably off of the balcony. Is a 25 naked, dead woman. She can't. And by the looks of things, has been there for a few hours, not days. Clean axe. Gee whiz. Is she dead? Max replies. With the affirmative. Yeah, well. She fell off my balcony. Well, the balcony. Well, I mean, I own the home. It's my balcony. I just don't want to say she fell off my balcony because it sounds like I'm in some way responsible for her falling off. She you know, she was fucked up and fell off and fell onto the table. So that's why I needed the cable guy to come in and put a cable up. So this 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 thing doesn't happen again. You know. One death or two or three, and you start getting a reputation. And I can't afford to get a bad reputation, Clint, you know, this is reputation-based industry. You know, you've got a green reputation. I don't want to get a dead woman in coffee table kind of reputation, 
Kinkos. But don't you want me to call the cops or do you want me to get someone like you, Washai? Max replies that she wasn't anyone, that the cops would only make things more complicated, that the cops don't really come out here, that they have their own police force, that he was a sheriff, that he sworn he was sworn in as a child, as a special duty officer, that he served in the Gulf War and Iraq and Iran and many other foreign places. The names are even more ethnic and confusing than those. Well, here's the problem, says Clint understanding that no police will be called that he is alone in this tube with this man who has lied to him more than told the truth. Here's the problem. I don't have any cable with me. All the cable we used will is tied up to a bridge somewhere tied up to a bridge, says Max. Damn, you must be green. That that's the oldest trick in Hollywood. Clint is still confused by the situation and then show of what to do. He felt so much warmer and safer and energetic in that car, speeding down the highway, the bus. Now he's here in this house and the air's very static. The view's very lovely and fuzzy, but the view inside isn't so good. Tell you what, those maps, you might not be the cable guy. I want to, but there's something about you. I like it. 26 you got something. You got it. I think. I think you do good on the screen. Maybe not the big screen. Maybe not yet. But I'm actually an agent. I'm a big Hollywood agent. I have a big tube in on the LA Hills. I have a dead prostitute who killed herself. And I was not involved in the accident. And it is in no way a murder or a homicide. And I think you would be perfect for the small screen. I actually have a show I'm developing at the moment. We need a quirky best friend, a cable guy, if you will, some to come in each episode and bring in a little melodrama, a little bit of pizza as an excitement. I think you're the guy. I think you're the guy. Quinn, do you want to be my guy? Clint shakes his head in the affirmative. He likes the idea of being the guy of being on the small screen. I'll settle for the small screen now. He wants the big screen later. Right now, Max has given him a show. That's all he wanted was a shop and a mansion and then two and a wife and some watches. Tell you what, Clint, grab a drink and come up with me to my balcony. You're obviously not up to fixing that with some cable. Okay. Actually, you know what, buddy, you go back to your dicks. You change up. You grab some cable. Actually, you do your job. You said you're the cable guy. Come back. You fix my balcony. And at exactly midnight, there's a party right here. Big party. Big Hollywood party. Don't get me my cable, boy. Pleasure meeting you, Clint. Hope to do business with you soon. Clint returns to the city below. He walks down the mountain and then on the eventful trip. He's in a city where cars were a necessity. He was in a city where lying is assessing. He is in a city where plastic lying cars are a necessity. He is in what many people view as the happiest, most beautiful place on earth, where dreams and careers flourish and where lying plastic faces and cars are a necessity. Clint goes into Home Depot. There were Home Depots in his hometown. But this one's nice. There's a guy there with a name tag that's been customized. 27 he's wearing glasses. It looks like the faggot friend in a sitcom. Clint is deeply and utterly infantilized with him. He looks like a father figure, like a happy figure. Clint appreciates the time that they spend together picking out cable. And when he leaves, he tells them that if he ever gets into position to help him out, he will cast him in a sitcom where he will be playing some faggot friend. The man is grateful. The man thanks Clint immensely, and he will not remember him the next day. Clint will remember this place and this time in arriving, ramshackle to a Home Depot for the rest of his life. Along with the cable, he buys some stuff for the party. He buys in black spy phrase life spray paint for his clothes, some work boots and fashions, a tie out of some aluminum siding. He returns up the hill. This time, the trip is not so contemplative and simple. It is up the side of a hill, 
up the side of a mountain. The flat city fades away into the rigors of topology built around the human anatomy. These hills look like they are powerful because when you look at them, you imagine climbing them. You imagine the difficulty of reaching that peak and can't imagine how anyone could ever live up there, live so high when they had to walk up there every day. But, of course, in a town of lions, plastic faces and cars, no one walks up those hills. They people barely live there. Clint arrives and waits outside for several hours before 12.00. You can see cars appearing. He decides to wait longer. At some point past 12.00, Clint decides to go in. He pauses and this instantly lets him. The house is ablaze with people with let her out sang with screaming pig lungs. That's her traveling magician has released as part of one of his tricks. Let's for close up magicians to every person. The people are the howdy do of Hollywood. They're all dressed as David Letterman and smirking and smiling with toothy grins. Most of them are shaved and receding hairlines at this point. David Letterman does not have a beard. None of the people in the party have a beard. Some of them have elected to take on plastic surgery procedures to make himself appear more like David Letterman. It is at 28 uproar if party and the people in attendance are orgasm orgasmically drinking in the exclusivity of the tube, their personage and the others around them, old money and new money mix in an inferno of close-up magicians that swarm the event. Clinton, you made it. And you got my cable, too. I knew I could trust you. I knew I could rely on you. You're the guy, says Max. Max is wearing a black leotard with white stripes hanging across it. You look great, Colin. You look like a Home Deep ragamuffin, like that old English-style ragamuffin fun word to say, says Max. Clint begins walking up to the balcony. Don't worry, Max. I'll get this fixed for you. And you were talking about that show. I'd love to audition for it. No, no. Anyway... Clint looks ahead of him and sees that there is now another body. Yeah, says Max. Someone else fell. Can't believe it. First person then just fell. Clint smiles and just walks up the stairs and wrapped the wire around two of the pillars, creating a very shoddy appendage under the house. Clint fears that this will not help anything. Additionally, the second dead woman looks like another prostitute. Looks like a similar looking prostitute, like Max is a type, this type is runaway girls. Max is standing at the bottom of the stairs with his fingers and thumbs in the shape of a rectangle. It's looking through. This rectangle is in his own head, pretending to frame a camera, probably in his own film that he's directing. Maybe he's even starring in it. Maybe the world is paying him to direct this film because he's so important. And he frames up this shot and tells Max to smile more, to look happier, to be brighter and taller. Clint, great job. Looks fantastic. Ready for the big stage. Hey, come over here, says Max, gesturing at a morbidly obese man with a squared looking nose and black fuzzy hair. This is the guy I'm talking about gesturing at Clinton. This is the handyman. This is the wire guy I was telling you about earlier. Down says the fat guy with a fuzzy hair. Damn. Looks good to me. Looks exactly like you describe on the phone. He's fantastic. What's his rights? 29 Clint shouts down, barely understanding. I'm white. I'm white. The fuzzy man can't hear him. This is for the best. This is awkward. Exchanges were damaged. Clint's chance of becoming a Hollywood star. Max and the fat man retire. They're talking animatedly moving their hands. They're focused on the idea of Clint rather than Clint himself. At this point, Clint could be any number of people rather than Clint. But they are still discussing him. They're in the process of forming a deal around an individual joining a television program. And the individual themselves is not involved. It's not relevant. It's not even a person in a scale between wristwatch and peg. They are something else. They're an abstract number, an entity. They're a gear in their relationships. Which one of them wants some more? 
Which one of them wants and less? Will he do this? Will he do that? Will he blab? Will he sing? Can I sing? Who is he? Who is he? Clint walks back down the stairs. He eyes up the two corpses in the living room. There's a bustling party around them and Clint feels like he can smell something on them. A stench and earthy stench. Clint. He's a virgin. And they're vivacious, cold, dead. He's. Sparkle in the pitch black glimmering room. That's David Letterman's are constantly surprised by the wit and magic of these magicians. Your new says the vice, I am, says Clint, turning to face it. It's a woman. So says Clinton's wife. What are you up to here in Hollywood, California? Clint says, while I think I've just been cast in a big show. Well, I don't know if it's a big show. I think I've just been cast in the show. I'm really looking forward to being a star. That's why I'm here. Clint's wife, at this point in the novel, I should point out that this is Clint's future wife and will here be referring to her as Clint's future wife until she is no longer Clint's future wife and becomes Clint's ex-wife and then deceased ex-wife. So, Clint, do you dance? Clint danced. They danced some Letterman's made way for them to dance. Clint avoided dancing too close to the Caucasus. No one seemed to mind 30 them too much. Some people posed for Polaroid images. iPhones were not invented yet. The Polaroid cameras were used to take pictures of auditioning children and other types of children too. As you didn't need to take them to a development lab, you could take any sort of pitch you wanted. This is a type of power that only God had before the Polaroid company invented the Polaroid camera to capture someone's soul and keep it in a rectangle. And look at it long after they died. Forever and ever. They danced. Letterman's eventually joined in. There were bartenders there, bought up from the city below, bought up to this world of access that they would never reach or understand and only interaction with would be pouring liquid into glass and serving it to people that view them as dirt. Great party. Yeah. Was it so and so's the other time the babble of conversation was intoxicating? The neurobabble of one 100 Hollywood executives. Things are about to change. Clint and Clint's teacher wife wound down that dancing, were drinking vodka tonic and Pepsis in the lounge. The second lounge, the one outside. It's a beautiful tube, says Plant's future wife. Beautiful tube. Yes, says Clinton. I will live in a tube like this one day, a big tube with a wife and some watches. Who are you anyway? Clint's wife looks down at the city below. Up at the skyline and the clouds disintegrating into the mountains around them. Mountains where people don't live on to Ob's real mountains. I'm the daughter of a big industry guy. I get things made. I guess you know how things are, but maybe you don't. Clint says, no, I don't. I arrived here on a Greyhound bus the other day. I'm already confused by this place, but I think I'm in love. Clint, Siege. Your wife smiles. Clint looks embarrassed. Blood vessels or whatever in the face causes a face become red. Activate. It's uncertain of why this happens. It doesn't seem to be a great defensive tool if it's there to flutter impress people, but it activates the matter. Nevertheless, you. No, I mean, I'm in love with the place, not you. I mean, you're very nice. I mean, you're beautiful. 31 I mean, Clint's future wife smiles and touches his hand. This is a clear sign, a flirtation. But in a court of law, this wouldn't stand up if Clint began a sexual encounter with her. It would still be classed as rape. Clint would need more to seal the deal to prove that any interaction they would be having wouldn't be consensual and completely without any sort of allegations for legal attack. Well, I did think you meant me. But you're forgiven. It's an interesting place. I grew up here. Clint has the feeling that this woman is about to change his life. She says to him, I like the way your eyes look. They're so green. Clint smiles. Lots of people call me green. Maybe I should change my name to green. They're about to kiss.
I know this because I'm a failed novelist writing this novel, even though they were interrupted at this moment and don't kiss for several years. I know they're about to kiss before they were interrupted. What are you lovebirds up to? A man exits the building like a junk in a film where a man exits a building and interjects himself into two nerds. One of them a female and one of them are male who are about to kiss. The audience knows this because it is telegraphed by that body language camera movement lighting. And the concessions of written films and novels. What are you lovebirds up to? He says again, nothing, says Clint, embarrassed, which is the convention? Nothing at all. They both look mortified. They've been doing nothing illegal. Both of them are of legal age. Clint quite clearly knows that if there is an investigation, he will be charged with rape, neutered and most likely killed. So why are you lovebirds up to? He asks a third time and a fourth. More people are leaving the party going outside to the second lounge. Maybe it was a balcony, the new Bob Hill SPU's outside. And people are happily girdling about this and that. The jock-like character is meeten by his friends again and caught up in a conversation. He then opens this conversation, extending it to the couple of Clinton, Clint's future wife. So we were just talking about how we love Chajkowski and other sorts of 32 expensive foreign films that can only be acquired on special DVD and VHS tapes and viewed in exclusive places, not multiplexes. What's your view on films? What have you been watching? Clinton's wife turns to the junk and says that she doesn't watch foreign films. She watches American films and drinks American beer and loves American boys, that she finds no need to indulge in the fetishization of foreign cultures, that she loves Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, Max and Sprite. She doesn't find any need to find friendship from communists. She says that there's a lack of understanding in why American films are beautiful and not just products, not just propaganda for products. She says her favorite films are whatever's new or whatever's on the screen right now. This second, this very second across a million screens in America. This is the films people are enjoying. People are flocking to hear people talk about and laugh about. And remember, not the films in those steel cans that contain value to people like you at partings, the films that right now are changing people's lives, that are making them better and making them happier. Not the films that you can write an essay about, but the films that you can write about in your diary. And you can say you had a great day with your nana. And you watch this or you watch that Clint found this beautiful. The rest of the people at the party were overcome by the veracity of the argument, and the content really wasn't important. They were from Los Angeles, California, and they were impressed by the speed at which she talked and the fact that she could form full sentences. The job taking had not properly swung into full effect during the night. If she had said this later, she might have been hung. She might have been killed. She might have been thrown off the balcony. She might have been killed with the same cable Clint had installed earlier that day. It's hard to say what would have happened. But what did happen was the gaggle of friends surrounding the junk pushed apart and disintegrated back into the party like a Roman legion being 33 swarmed by Mongols disintegrating back into the countless reams of imitations of themselves. Like a deck of cards scattered across a room with different numbers and classes. But still cards. Yeah, this is the guy I was telling you about. This is the guy I was telling you about. Max has returned now outside and is ready to do business. He has already said that this is the guy I've been telling you about. And Clint was indeed the guy he'd been telling you about, been telling everyone about. This is the guy that fixed my cable. This is the handyman. This is the handyman that we need. Yeah, this guy's real good. I'm looking forward to working with him. He's fantastic. No. He doesn't have an agent. No, he's green. He's real green. Clint, you sweep him off his feet. He's carried away by several people. They are producers. They are Hollywood hoity toity. They're encouraging Clint to do things with his body and mind to prepare himself for the role. 
to get ready for it. They're very excited. Clint's future wife grabs him by the arm and hands him a coaster. For a strip club. That's where I work. You can come there and meet me anytime and take me out. Clint puts it in his pocket as he's carried out of the room by the gaggle of producers. The sitcom's called Build Build. Yeah yeah. It's going to be massive. Yes, we've got this crew and this cast and this person, this set. And we're doing the things differently. They all say it's hard to tell which one of them are talking. They all look the same. They all have the same facial feature. That phrase a funny type of hair. Clint seeing for the first time. It's an interesting gaggle of people. Clint brought into the kitchen where he is asked to perform a rudimentary juggling drink with an apple and an orange. This is where I'm talking about, says Mac. This is what I'm fucking talking about, is gesturing wildly with one hand spinning his index finger pointed at the floor and then up at the ceiling. This is what I'm talking about, this is authentic. This guy gets it. He just gets it. He's green. He gets it. He's the 34 apple. He's the orange. He's everything. He's my guy. I can't believe this guy just walked into my house. Who's the one? Clint is encouraged by being complimented so much but doesn't see why it's happening. He's beginning to feel what people call imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a real thing, but is often identified with simply being weak-willed, of being a weakling, of being a little baby man. Baby. Wow, man. Most people are baby wawa man. And they don't feel imposter syndrome because of some social pressure. They feel it because that deep within them there is an effectualness of masculinity or femininity, like a cancer or broken ovaries or a dead womb. That means that they are essentially not who they are. They are essentially a skeleton with blood and bones and nothing else. And they are falling, hurtling through life. Such a dramatic speed that there's no way that they can ever recover from that for. And they are wearing clothes and those clothes, say, doctor or nurse or dental student or filmmaker or actor, and they don't feel like they are their own. Even though they might as well have fallen into anything, they are falling anyway. They're all falling anyway. Fantastic. Fantastic, says Max. Can't wait for this. So three cameras show live or studio audience will get your lines will signing up to my friend's agency. It's fantastic. It's going to be great. Clint. Clint smiles. He's made it. He's made it. He finally made it. Max and his Gogola friends began talking again. Some people don't seem to be too convinced that Clint is the one. He's the guy, the guy that they need to get. A small argument breaks out and someone pulls out a butter knife from one of the cabinets and jabs wildly at Max. Max grabs the knife by its handle and breaks the guy's arm. You guys better get this TV isn't a story. It isn't a place. It's an idea, man. And I have one idea that if you pull a knife in my home again, I'm not just going to break your arm. I'm going to write a letter to the king of television. And I'm going to get you thrown off. You've got me pig. The crying jeer recedes into the swarm of ineffectual house cats. It's not the first bone 35 that's going to be broken that night or the loft. As don't forget, Max has already killed two women that day. They're for legal reasons, I must say. Max did not kill those women and they fell accidentally after Cordis. Max turns back to Clinton. Funny story, man. Funny story. We're going to remember this. We're going to remember the exact situation where you got this role and people are going to be writing about how you got this role for decades. I can't believe I cast you just now. That's it. We're going to get you to sign the paperwork and then you're cast in the sitcom. You get that right. It's a big deal. It's a big sitcom. You'll be meeting your co-stars. It's going to be fantastic. The party begins to devolve fully. Clint is introduced to cocaine for the first time before this. The only drug he did was huffing gasoline and sucking his uncle's cock and comparing penis size with his cousin. He drank once, but didn't enjoy it. 
he did enjoy the cocaine. He can't find his future wife anywhere, and instead falls asleep on the pull-out couch. Clint awakes, he's on the set. Everyone else is there. His co-stars, they all have names that they will not be named Town Quince will roll on the show. It's simple. He's the guy guy. He comes in two-eighths into the episode and produces something funny, produces something else funny, shuffles them around, posses one of them off, holds one of them as a teaser for the next episode. Clint is wearing a policeman's uniform with shorts showing his hairy legs and weak ankles. Max is ecstatic. He is clearly still on cocaine. He's still drinking and wearing the same clothes. He looks like he's still in his tub. But in actual fact, he's on the set of the show he's producing. You look great, Clint. You look great. You look great, Clint, Max says he's spending. Clinton has the feeling that Max is out of control. Become exactly nice if other people know this. They know if Clint is out of control himself. 36 after all. He's about to put a steel ball bearing the size her fist in his arsehole on public television. Clint's first rehearsal is an important part of the story. The audience funnels in, they're off the street. They're gambling. They're muttering and happy to be part of television. They're happy to see the warmth and the cameras and the lights and the stars and people taking things and filing things and moving across in shuffling cables and organizing sets and painting doors onto witches' houses. Ding dong, honey, is this my home? The protagonist of the show is drunk. It is played for laughs, but it is brutal to see. He enters the house. Honey, is this my house? Honey. Is this my house? A Vietnamese woman comes down from upstairs as this is a cheap sitcom set. There are no upstairs. But instead the stairs lead nowhere. And the camera simply cut them off before they reach this top floor. Who you? Who you this know your house? You leave now. The drunk man is furious. The audience giggle every pause and intonation in his speech. You shut the fuck up. You can laugh. No, you leave now, she says, barely understanding what he's saying. He begins to remove his belt and walks forward, his trousers falling down. It is clear that he is attempting to go to bed and preparing himself. No, you leave now. You leave now. She walks down the stairs further and is holding her son's baseball bat. His son is away currently at a baseball camp and cannot help her as she is about to be raped and murdered by this drunkard, the scoundrel. Ding dong. Mrs. Ching Chong Chang. Laughter. An Asian name like this is hilarious. She is so disgusting. Clint enters his still dressed as the postman. This was his costume. This was his role. This was why he got into show business this moment here to prove himself. This is Ching Chang. The door was open and it's 6 a.m. What are you doing, man? In my house. Man in my house. Going to kill me. Mrs. King Chung. I've got post for you. The drunk man turns. He's about to fight the postman and then he recognizes it. And it's you clean. I know you. You're playing the postman on 37 the show. You're drunk, says Clint. You're fucking drunk. Look at you. What do you mean? Yeah, of course I'm drunk. It's my, um, and come into the wrong house drunk at the beginning of the show. No. You're really drunk. That's Clint. You're really, really drunk. And you're making a fool of yourself. You're making a fool of yourself in front of my new friends. The woman comes downstairs further. She is frightened. She is scared. She is not only holding a baseball bat, but also holding a steel ball. Her Asian son used to use this as practice with instead of a normal ball because that's all Asians were allowed to practice with or something along those lines. No, you leave now. You both leave now. No mail, no mail. You go home. There's no your house. The star of the show strikes, punches her across her cheekbone shattering it and the woman collapses. Frontwards, backwards all sop, 
The protagonist of the show has aroused the steel ball rolls towards Clint. Clint knows this part of the show. Well, this is what he's worried about. This is his moment. The protagonist's trousers are now threaded over his shoes as he takes them off. There are more guffaws from the audience. There is more laughing. He is clumsy and ineffectual at it and takes an exaggerated amount of time. Probably because of the exuberance of rape that is about to occur. The ball rolls and stops at Clint's foot. Clint bends over slowly and picks this ball up at perfectly round perfectly its right weight like a single atom. Clint turns around. His shorts are cut by his anus. He had had several injections earlier that day to dull any form of pain and begins inserting the bone inside of himself. It's not painful. It feels more like raising a pot of a stick man than a board. You've drawn. When a whiteboard on a blackboard. Her protagonist inserts himself into the Asian woman on the floor. She's still almost conscious, squirming and suffering hair covering her face. As a guy enters her, he says, wait a second, this isn't my house. The intro music begins to play. Clint knows he needs to hold the ball perfectly in his 38 anus for the entirety of the intro and then let it release onto the floor. The cameras are zooming in. This is a money shot. This is what they've been talking about. Clint's ball muscles are clenching. Blood is beginning to perforate the edges of his asshole around the ball. And that's what everyone's talking about. The ball drop. The camera's cut back on. Max is staring, deftly, tapping his arsehole with a long stick, gesturing, miming the action. Now let it go. Now let it go. Clint releases his anus, the ball and a fine speckle of blood. Thud to the floor. The crowd. A rolling wave of orgasms hit them as a perfectly timed gag in real time unfolds in front of them. The gesture of cinema, of TV, of storytelling, of decades of exposure to light and thundering noise and cars and technology is exposed to be fatal. Is it supposed to be a faint memory of this exact moment? Clint's done it. He's a star. He's made it big. Two years later, Clint finds his trousers next to that couch that he slept on at the house party. They have the bartender thing. His future wife's bartender stripper thing in them. He thinks he'll look her up. Clint arrived in Los Angeles, California, as a man who's only had sex with a few women and abused by a few men. Post point being a famous celebrity in California. It was forced upon him to have sex with multiple women, some at the time someone underaged, Some blindfolded. Some missing with Max. Some of them that fell off balconies as well. Some of them that died. Another wife didn't think they'll look up. His future wife does. He arrives at a strip club patted down by the bouncer. The bouncer smiles at him. He recognizes him. He knows who he is. He's seen him on TV. Everyone's seen him on TV. Everyone watches TV. Everyone is TV. Everyone goes into the room alongside Clint. They're watching him. It's a strip club. And currently a woman is lying on an admiring ironing board, fingering an iron as it ironed the shirt. As another woman dressed as a man is reading the paper. Smoking a pipe with her pussy out. Telling the woman ironing how much she loves her, how 39 important she is to him. And she is holding his leg as she irons tells him that she's gonna do better at work. The bar is almost empty. There's mirrors and the types of things you would imagine the strip club would have. They have them all and they have tea leaves. We've seen a gaudy reminder of how cheap cunts are compared to sports or TV. There's also an irony in a sense that it's Hollywood. Even while fantasizing about fucking Somalia, middle and the attractive, beaten up woman has gone to Hollywood to start a music career and does end up showing her pussy on stage. That cinema is important, that it's important to watch movies as it is a time when movies and dreams are made. The current show ends and the new show begins where a husband is too tired to maintain an erection. And the wife holds his penis and balls while he sleeps. Clint sidles up to the bar and gets a drink and then moves to one of the booths. 
Can I get you anything else? A woman comes up to him. It's Glenn's future wife. You can I don't know if you recognize me. Of course I recognize you. She said, come with me. They go into the next room. This is a private show. Do I need to pay more? He says, she said now that this is her office and this is where she does her business and that she's not a prostitute after all, or a stripper or sex worker. And she just works here because if it's like a cool progressive thing to do to work at a strip club, it's very sex positive. And she thinks that women. And sex so, infinitely interesting. They go on a date together, leaving the strip club. She's driving and Clint begins rubbing her leg and her purse to the side of her head and she minds. The radio play is an advert for Bud Light beer that Clint enjoys. He thinks about drinking Bud Light and eating a person in the taste of bloodline and a person and mixing together in his mouth. Forty they arrive at a restaurant and eat food down. Chemicals in their stomach dissolve the food. They lock eyes and chemicals in their brain, activate bladders and pumps, sheet these chemicals around their body and they feel like they're falling and they're wearing clothes, wedding clothes, but they don't have imposter syndrome at all. They feel like they are exactly who they need to be in this moment. And they all feel this way forever about this moment, even when they hate each other. And even when she's dead. They return to her house. It's huge. It's her father's house, and she lives in a life-sized dollhouse in the back. It's quite pleasant. Except everything's missing the details. The full five house would have doorknobs don't turn. They're just shiny bits of metal attached to wooden planks. They have sexual intercourse with each other. Clint is about to leave as he has done what he feels is biologically essential to his race's survival. But he doesn't. He stays and they get married. They go to a lake under the pretense of a nice visit to a lake there. Clint has a orchestra, a small six-piece string band that play the theme song to his show and he produces the ring for metal cylindrical egg. He's been keeping. In his anus later that night during the ritual, Clint can tell that she is faking. Clint is very happy with the acquisition of his new wife for a period of time. Wives have become a trendy, valuable tool in the LA scene as there has begun an underground series of wife wars. Clint's wife is tall. She has brown hair. And she's phenomenally beautiful with perky fat tits. Clint goes to his friend's house and they sit in a circle on couches with their wives. 41 and instead of doing anything degenerate to their wives. After days of discussion and talking, going to the center and begin fighting. This is a mixture between a ritual, something sexual and true combat to the death. Clint's wife is fighting another woman who is taller than her. He's blonde. Long hair and a boxy square. They're both clothed and polite, each other slapping each other's faces and breasts, pinching each other's sides and fighting as hard as they can. Some of the people in the circle theorize that there is something counter-cultural or counter-capitalist or counter-masculine about this process that is somehow progressive or interesting. Some deviants find it sexually exciting. Others view it as a way of Clint Dunn's to battle women like they would spinning tops as a schoolboy point of contention. His wife is beautiful. His car is faster. His house is bigger. Your show gets more people watching. Max turns up on day to a wife. He hasn't got a wife, which is normally considered a big no-no, but he's got needs and there's a movie role that's just come up and Clint's got the part without even auditioning. And he doesn't need to put any steel balls in his arsehole for this one. Clint is standing on set. 42. This is the second set he's been to. This is a film set. It's different from a TV set because the cameras aren't shooting on two discs, but instead shooting onto a type of special plastic with chemicals onto it. And everyone on set is a lot quieter. And he's being paid a lot more to produce a lot less. There is a bubble, a hubbub. There are always crowds. Clint is trying to remember his lines. He's drunk from the night before. He's been doing mounds of cocaine. He's someone needs to remember his lines because they're about to turn the camera onto them. And record, sound and image, 
and it's much easier for him to remember his lines this way than to do it in post some other way. Clint is standing on the set trying to remember his lines. He says them again and again. He doesn't want to forget them. Eventually, the director calls action. The director has a strange potato head and it's famously ugly. It's one of the reasons why he's directing a show of how truly and utterly hideous hands he stands out in a meeting. He's the one you remember a guy who's that ugly. Action. Clint remembers his lines and says them. He says one word after the other. And it's clear what he's saying. And he doesn't wink at camera or look at anyone behind the camera, which are the main things an actor needs to do to give a good performance. Clint is pretty happy with his state in life. He has a beautiful wife and is remembering his lines. Eventually he drinks too much and does other things, too. And the film's production becomes delayed. They're not happy with the amount he's drinking or the other stuff he is doing. And they don't really care about his wife. Clint thinks he's had an idea. He's going to remember his words less and less and turn up on set later and later until people can't deal with him 43 anymore. And he's going to blow up and scream at them, scream into their faces and their ears and hit them on the side of their heads until they no longer speak to him. And he lives on the street. And he's one of the people that can no longer rejoin society because they have a smile on them like a dog would have on it. The only other dogs could tell that it was not one of them and was from somewhere else or did something differently. Clint is sitting in an interview room, to his right is an easel and an image from the show that he appears on is moved from being a side character to a larger character. The film that he is starring in is spiraling out of control with every day of shooting. This interview, then, was not supposed to clash and override the shooting in the film, but it has. Scheduling has become a nightmare. There are pages of gunshots and post-it notes spread across walls and production offices across America trying to sort out. The film in turmoil, Clint strokes the interviewer's dog. It wasn't customary to bring a dog turned to view this interview as a gimmick was that he was blinded as a child in an acid attack. Both dog everywhere he went. So, Clint, we are hearing great things about this new film you're working on. Can you tell us anything about it? Clint replies. I can I can tell you that the film is going to be really fantastic and has some great cast and crew behind it, and it's going to be really good. The interviewer is amazed. That does sound fantastic, Clint replies. Yeah, it's going to be really fantastic and 44 great and a good film. The interviewer feel a certain sense of completely frenzy. He realizes that this new film is going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. Anything he does in his life will not make a difference to how amazing this new film by this massive Hollywood A-list will ever be. Thank you, Clint, thank you for your time. No problem, man. The next interview comes and sits down. This happens a few more times. And then Clint is led out to a car and it's driven away. On the way back to the set, the driver tells him that he is running late and that we had tissue the day with your stunt. Clinton looks confused. My stomach. I didn't know they found one. Yeah. The driver says we had to do the day with your stum. We found one. Well, they found one. I didn't find one. I'm just the driver at. Anyway, I'm you know, it's like if you need someone to be driving your film or you think I'm doing a great job, I would really be interested in auditioning to be in the film with you. Such a great actor. And I really appreciate you know, use this opportunity to speak to you. We really did. If you could just pass my details along to let me be your agent on the director. That'll be really great. Just get in the film. Clint smiles, knowing that the driver will not only never be featured in a film like Clint will be very soon. He has no chance to ever even be an extra. Clint is an entirely different caliber of human being to this driver. Both the driver and Clinton are this at this moment in time. Clinton was set to discover that his stunt double is now acting in his place. His stunt double recently. 
became a topic of hot discussion as he didn't exist. No one could find a stunt double anywhere in town. It looked just like Clint. This was assumed because Clinton had been green so recently. Hey, Faith still hadn't deformed to the pancake bloat starfish look that most Hollywood actors have at this time and do even to the far distant future. Clint, as he was walking to sit now in a hustle and bustle, 45 was being told by a PA penis assistant that another stuntman in the star had been injured in a horrific crash. The star had been killed, but the stuntman's face had only just been severed. The stuntman had been paid a very small amount of money to have his face reconstructed, not in his own boring image of a dead celebrity, but in a new, exciting, dynamic face of Clint, a view they've put his face to make it look like yours, Clint. He's your new stunt double. They made him special just for you. Was nervous. He could feel something dangerous coming. A new energy, a chapter in his life. About Oakland. A clone saga. Clinton arrived on set. His stump was dead smiling. Hey, Clint, don't mind me. I'm just cleaning up this turkey grief for you, pal. Clint was instantly at ease. His double, his stump. His main man was friendly. Clinton was instantly put at ease by his demeanor. That's cool. Don't worry about him. His stump said to Clinton, Go away in the trailer. Your wife's in the... I'll just finish up the scene. The director smiled and nodded quickly as Clint walked back into the trailer. Clint's wife wasn't there. Instead, there was a launch pile of fake snow. Clint used a very small spoon like a child would use to pick up ice cream, even smaller than that and shovel this fake white snow into his nose until his heart beat faster. And other chemical reactions happened as a result of the cocaine entering his bloodstream. Clint felt fantastic as his stump delivered a performance of a lifetime. Outside the trailer, Clint woke up, the day's shoot was over. He had done great. He had done fantastic. One of the best days of his life. That sitcom was so long ago. He was nailing this film gig. He felt like calling his wife. But the phone was already ringing. Hello, Clint, famous Hollywood movie star. I fell asleep in my trailer. Who is this? It's me, Clint, your wife. It was Clint. Current wife. Future dead wife on the phone. Why are you ringing me? Clint asked his wife. Well, you were going to ring me, but I rang you first. She said, yes, I suppose you did. I want to talk to you about this stunt double, 46 says the wife. Yes. Clint, something makes me nervous about him. I don't like the fact that he has your face and it's so accurate to yours. I think it's dangerous. I don't feel good about this. You should talk to your agent about this. It's not good. Clint's wife was obviously distressed by this stunt double's striking appearance to Clint. Clint decided that she was right and he should go to Max. So Clint drove his car down roads and up mountains to Clint's glass tube friend's house. Max Clint is acclaimed with open arm Max. Clint claimed with open arms. They were mirrors of each other, smiling and bashful and boastful holding drinks with white fluid inside. They arrived. What's this pleasure that I owe your visit to Clint? As they turned around and marched within Max's home, there were a few more women lying crestfallen on the floor of his living room. Some of them had begun to decompose roughly at the same rate as the sales of an album on the 90s top 10 charts, but cresting and peaking and then quickly slipping into a thumb, a turgid sludge. A faceless textualist nothing. I'm worried about this double max. My stunts got this idea. Well, it's more my wife, Maxine. She's acting out. She thinks my stomach's up to no good. I didn't even know you had a stunt, says Max. Oh, yes. He looks just like me. Well, that's good, says Max. Your stunt should resemble you or else. Expensive prosthetics will need to be purchased for every shot and applied every day. Well, it's a simple solution, says Max. We'll just simply call him up and fire him. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, 
There's Max down the phone. Is this Clint's stunt? Yes, replied the voice. It didn't sound much like Clint that was down anything. The doctors hadn't changed. Well, can you reverse this surgery then? Sorry, who is this? This is Max. This is Clint's agent. Well, the surgery is reversible unless I get into another car accident. He was cut off. Funny, says Max. Sounds like some sort of car accident. Well, it seems like this dilemma has been solved by good fortune for us and bad fortune for your stunt double. Yes, I glanced smiling, pursing his lips and sucking the white 47 fluid from his glass into his cheeks, then compressing his cheeks and forcing it through his teeth, over his tongue and down his throat into whatever sank white fluids kept inside that human body. Well, that nastiness is behind us, says Max. Let's look at the olives for tonight's adventures. Unthinking, double stuffed. But my waiter and chefs are telling me that single stuff. So all the rage. And, you know, I have a reputation for olives. That's not the only thing you have a reputation for, says Clint, smiling. Clint has become a quintessential Hollywood man. Big shot, Max turns and looks Clinton. There's not a shred of green of leaves of moss. His eyes look black. Yeah, you're right. I do have a reputation for that stuff, Clint. I do have a reputation for other stuff. And you will, too. Clint was sitting in his bathroom in his L.A. mansion that he bought with his wife. He was staring across the tiled floor perfectly, sovereignly white to a plastic bag containing several rotting bananas. This was all the food he had managed to buy today. It's right on the windowsill. Was a series of contact lenses disposable? They looked like alien eggs. Clint scrunched his feet in the garbage bag. He was using four Sean's. Things have gotten dramatically worse financially for him. He barely bought the house before the whole industry collapsed. His last film grossed two of cents at the cinema. There was a problem. People weren't interested in what he sold. 48 Clint didn't know what he was going to do, what he was going to tell his wife, how he was going to choke down these bananas. With their white France. And dripping black. Scars. Clinton knew that he wasn't able to adapt to the new, this new world, that he was specialized in pretending to be someone on film. He couldn't become a carpenter or someone that worked their hands or contribute to society and he must somehow maintain the life of a celebrity. And this meant not contributing anything other than his image. And only when he was being paid. Clint got up from the tour. The water had been cut off to his mansion for many days. And the pile of shit was reaching the brim. On the white marble toilet, you walked across the toilet floor, picking up the plastic sack of bananas. Darling, darling, no caveman's bank with his kill said Clint jokingly. It's been many millennia since man lived in caves, had to kill things. Little did he know. Baby, come in here, look at this, said Splint's current wife. Look at this, it's perfect. Clint had a sudden sinking feeling he knew what his wife was about to show him. Clint entered the room. Clint's wife was sitting with a salesman on the long, white L-shaped sofa in a pristinely white room. The sofa was beautiful. You could sleep in it. House guests could sink into the long base of the sofa and dream about one day living in the house so immaculately beautiful as Clint. The movie stars and his current wife. Honey, honey, look at this. Isn't this perfect? This is what I've always wanted. This one. This is the one. This is beautiful. Clint's wife was looking at Clint with someone else's face attached to her skull. She had undergone a very common procedure where the front of one's phalanxes remains to make way for new faces and new fashions. They came and went as they are off to do in Los Angeles, California. This is it, baby. This one is perfect. I have to have this one. Since wife has become addicted to fame, since this was common as well in Hollywood. 49 Los Angeles, California. Honey, this is the one. This is the one. 
This is perfect. She was repeating herself. She had an animated look in her eye. Like Bugs fucking Bunny. She needed this face more than she needed the house or her clothes. Or her teeth at that moment in time. She knew that this new face would sort everything out. The face looks something like her. More Chinese. This is... This is perfect. Clint squinted at the face. He can remember if that's what she looked like underneath all those layers of faces. Which one in all those? Terracotta boxes were hers. Elle's original face was the one that she wore on their wedding night when they exchanged rings and vows. When they met on a balcony. He looks great, said Colin. It's peaceful, but we can't afford it. They had an argument that resembled kids squabbling in a playground over who could be which fictional character in a game. Eventually, Clint settled on being the disgruntled, loving husband, spiraling into a wild, alcohol-fueled depression. And Clint's wife settled on paying the wife of a movie star and spending money recklessly at the expense of all other things. The salesman smiled. Yeah, this one's perfect. This one's perfect. You know, I have one more one real special one. One that just came on the market. Clint turned. Even Clinton was intrigued. Salesmen have the ability to convince you that you need something when you don't need something. They like alcohol. No one in that room was thirsty, but they would drink whatever that man poured into a glass and they would do so happily. They'd pay him. They would invite him to his house. Yeah. This new one, someone I won't say, who had to sell her very, very rare face. Very, very rare face indeed. Can't say he felt it, but it was very rare. He opens a second briefcase. It brought several places. A white mahogany box on a table already stacked with boxes, made of different materials, with different in lines, with different faces inside Clint's wife, who pressed her hand together release them and press them together at an incredibly high frequency like a hummingbird. Fifty but clapping her hands, tapping the palms together. And did you feel a little? What? What? What noises to express her inner delight that this mystery box, containing the face that only the most affluent could see, let alone dream of purchasing? May I? Of course, the salesman says. Of course. The salesman's heart is slowing. His mouth is becoming dry. His hands are incredibly steady. If Clint's wife opens the box and reveals her, thanks. Oh, wow, it's lovely. She says, it's lovely, it's lovely, I have to have it. I have to have it. Clint smiles, you can't. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. Don't you understand? They say more things like this to each other. Clint's wife is saying she has to have it. And then she lists reasons most of them are hysterical. And Rim, it would be nice to eat rice in that mask and that face wearing the length. Clint is telling them that they can't afford it. That the Southland must go. They've already spent enough that she has enough that the masks aren't going to make anyone any happier or younger. Their marriage any less stable. Or maybe they weren't. Maybe that's why she was buying them to destroy the marriage, to burn down this house, to turn Clint into an alcoholic, to turn the veins of his face into liquor, highways implanted, bloating the star's face, damaging everything he had built. Built around his face, around the human brain's ability to recognize a human face again and again. Even after weeks of not seeing it or months, the survival instinct that was being utilized perfectly by the American cinema industry. Labor, her plan involved, claimed getting a new face, both 51 getting different face since becoming so poor that they have performed surgeries illegally. They harvested faces from sleeping men on the street. Screening without anesthetic as a comfort. Thanks. Saw them under bridges. Putting on planes in the street, screaming at police officers and putting veins to good use in silver needles, pumping thick black tar into that body. The salesman left his salt masks. He was happy the faces that he had sold. He got two from other women performing surgeries in their living rooms. 
if they can't afford the payments. He will out jauntily chortling with every step. His wife move to count things and on another, and empty the bananas under the table with all of the boxes, they feasted on the black and sticky bananas. Ring, 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 Clint said, ring, ring. Remember when my phone used to ring, ring, Clint's wife smiled jauntily, her teeth chuckling. If they came out from the shadow of lips, I remember lots of things. Baby, I remember lots of things. Ring, 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 ring. It was the telephone there, not Clint. They had both the telephone ringing. Clint screamed towards the telephone. Moving so fast, his footsteps became a Doppler effect, proving EM to Scranton was at least a local phenomenon. After all, clean crabs. The white marble telephone receiver lifted it to his head. With such speed, it gave him a black eye and hurt that bit of gum. Just between your teeth and your skin. Hello, Clint. This is Clint. I'm a famous movie star. Who is it? It's me, baby. Max. Max. Clint says, thank God it's you, Max. You got something for me, Max. Yeah, I think I do. And I think I got something big. We've been working on something. What do you know about American Gladiator? Clinton says. Are we talking about that TV show, American Gladiator? Max says no. I want to be clear when I say American Gladiator, within the context of our conversation over the series of this book, has no legal right to have recourse to the show American Gladiator. And we do not want to disparage its good name or reference it without permission. No. Then, says Clint. I don't know what American Gladiator is. 52 come to my house around 3 a.m. Bring your wife and I'll show you what American Gladiator is, says Max. I can't tell what face Max is making. On the other side of the line, miles away in his own Hollywood mansion. And it seemed as a dark face, one that caused the contortions of a grin and a frown. Our brow and mire deep set on thin ice, cascading pools of darkness over Max's ascetic, grinning face. Somewhere on a hill in California, Max spends the rest of the day and the beginning of the night avoiding his wife, avoiding his life, looking at framed pictures of himself in movies and TV shows. And thinking, was exact point, people's brains no longer keep that bit of electricity inside that would remember his face when they saw him like a keyhole, filling in with sand, until the bladed keeny could no longer impregnate the door with its secret binary. You ready yet? I can't I can't pick. Clint's wife was cheating her face and she was telling, criminy, she couldn't pick. I can't pick. I can't. Clint was wearing black brogues. That's that had leathers reaching up to the top of his knee, which was the style he was wearing, red and mauve knickerbockers, which popped out at his waist, which was the style with a silk shirt that said Shelve. The only good native is a dead native. In black and red font cursive and a diagonal stripe across it, he was wearing transparent sunglasses that would only let in sunlight. He had a wallet in his pocket with no money in it. And had to say, Let's watch. Two days earlier to buy a bag of bananas that he forgot about in the bath. His wife came down. She was running plastic bags on her feet. Come a band holding a wig, covering her vagina and heads duct taped her tits to her body like Princess Leia and Star Wars. She was wearing another human being face. That Clint could recognize her across the huge mansion's grand hall when they were being escorted round, when they were visiting 53 it, before they purchased it. The person trying to sell them, this team told them that this would be a great reception area. Clint felt like he was underwater and waiting for it to be too painful in his lungs and his head before he had to get up and get out. But Clint didn't quite know what getting air meant because he didn't want to go up to that glistening, dry wind the world above the water. He liked it down here. He knew down here he can move into actions unimaginable to the men that lived up there. They arrived at Max's house. The Uber driver recognized them.
They probably shouldn't have taken a neighbor, but I was too lazy to put them in a horse and cart or some other novel means of travel. The Uber driver wanted the war to grow, but they quickly discovered that he was trying to get them to sign a picture of a condor, which was hugely offensive in the current political climate. Makes his house, was a sombering and key black. Jellyfish, slovenly spewed onto the side of the mountain. The driver scraped away. He would tell his friends that he had seen a famous Hollywood actor and barely remember his name. Max was standing at the same spot in the house where they had met so many years ago. Here they are. Here they are. Max said in a sing-song chant. Here they are. 54 Clinton, his wife, moved towards each other for protection. As if there was a gale moved up. Now to Sheffield stands towards Max and just oily. So, Max, big break. You've got a project for us. You've got a project for me. Man Clint. Not so green anymore and not so green. I know, baby. What's what's this deal then? You've got me a good will. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? What was it you said on the phone? American Gladiator. Max smiled and lifted the VHS camera. He was holding his arm. Yeah. American fucking Gladiator. Max said that Rupert Nero stepped out from a nearby bush and punched his wife. In her uterus, she doubled up in agony. The strangest face. Mimicked that of someone in pain. Clinton said he doubted that that person could feel pain. How do you like those apples? Dinara said. And then started moving towards Clint. Max held in an axle stationed of ecstasy. Glorious pain down here. Just captured in 320 pay to 80. I mean, his home video camera. Tanaren was now in the range of attack of Clint that moved closer. To clearly assert his dominance and to take a better striking stance against him. Clint lashed out, breaking down Iran's nose. You've had bank a notion. Can I? Clinton and Bush, someone since he left his small town. Clint was angry, was underwater and couldn't move in special ways that other people couldn't. Clint descended upon Bobby. Bobby stopped being Bobby after a while and became a sack of bones and organs all mixed up or not working properly. Like repeatedly firing an F-16 into an orchestra. Bobby no longer had the right mixture of oxygen and blood or electricity in its blinding rain to function. Max was silent for a long second, seconds so long it might have, in actual fact, been multiple seconds. You fucking did it. Wow. Fuck. He just killed him. Fuck. This is no longer an exit. See, this is an orgasm. You fucking did it, man. You made my fucking tape. Boom. American fucking gladiator. It was several weeks later. The American Gladiator tape had gone international. 55 The Hollywood film business that previously had been in such decline that one of its major stars was forced to eat rotten bananas with his wife was now almost entirely back off of the back of Max Sweet. Sweet Max. I always knew you had my back. Max Clint, as he put it on. If diamond encrusted the hard nail and entered the ring. Grace Kelly and Kellyanne Conway were in the ring. They both had semitones which said drink Coca-Cola on them. The crowd was massive. They were cheering and hollering. Clint was unarmed. They had good armor, which could definitely stop the blows. Hollywood Gladiator and big lights shone on top of the building they were in, which was the biggest building in the world, even bigger than the IKEA factory where they made chance. Kellyanne Conway struck on Clint. He dodged smacking her in the face so hard that her solar plexus exploded. He grabbed the scimitar from her thinking to himself how much he would enjoy a smooth Coca-Cola. Right about now. And slashed the other bitch's head off in a while. Cinematic moment. That would look great in a trailer. He thought that this was in a trailer. This was his life and he was winning big time. Clint did it again. Clint did it again. Screamed Max. Holding a VHS camera, filming all of this for the trillions of fans across the world.
The next fight is Jeff Goldblum vs. Danny DeVito. Clint turned and walked off stage. Hands were moved. The bodies of the two women he had just killed. The policeman promptly arrested him and he was taken to jail where he would serve the new celebrity murder sentence of 13 seconds of looking at a picture. Well, one of their greatest performances on a night had held up against his cell before being released. The new celebrity murder law was initially put in place when Miley Cyrus accidentally drove her to toolbars under the influence into another tour bus. This time filled with children. She killed 128 children and would serve more than 3,000 years in prison. She was not only under the influence, but in recordings, expressly pointed out her disgust for children and how she was going to murder over a hundred of them in a few seconds because she hated them so much, the public was so outraged that she would be in 56 prison for 3,000 years for these matters that they insisted that after you become a certain amount of famous, a murder should give you 13 seconds in prison as a minimum and 14 as the maximum, you should have to at least look at them, the person you murdered in a film if they had ever been in one. Miley Cyrus spent a few minutes in prison and then left a better person. This was the main impetus for Max starting Hollywood Gladiator. This, of course, this, of course, caused some initial teething problems where Hollywood stars would start shooting people at shows, killing journalists. But eventually this evened out and everyone became a lot happier and smiled more at strangers on the bus. And the strangers smiled back like they lived in a small village. But in actuality, they lived in this city and their lives are miserable and short. And no one would remember them. And one day, people recognized their faces. Even people that loved them very much once upon a time. And if they were very lucky, a baby somewhere. An ugly baby would have their second name. Clint was a star, again, a big star. He was one of the best American gladiators out there. His original recording had put him in good stead. That being the best. And today showing Cher that he was not only good at killing dangerous people, but had no sense of strain, killing basically retarded women with semitones and cold blood in an arena in Los Angeles, California. Clint is lounging in his L.A. mansion. His wife is in another room muttering on the phone. His office is all surrounded by not only the posters and memorabilia from his film career, but now his bird you thing, American Gladiator career. The heads of his slain opponents. Weapons that have a particular and logical value culturally at this moment in time, hang on the wall of his office. Clip-on destroyed himself. That American Gladiator is not so different from his acting career. That in many ways, acting is the act of acting, of exalted elements of life, like a baby born in Chernobyl and then one day expressing it like a tumor in the 57 brain, causing wild, spasmodic behavior that is only acceptable when it's performed in front of a camera. Clinton had a big fight coming up. He was very excited. American Gladiator Oscars were coming up soon, too. And he had a good feeling that he was going to be nominated for one of the world's population, was so tired of the old Hollywood. They were more than happy to see them with each other apart. It was their fantasy in many ways to see them slaughter each other, to see them kill the innocent, and to see them humanized and dehumanized to the point of Dante's beyond drug addictions and broken marriages and plastic in their faces. This new heady hedonism of supreme voyeurism resulted in pure Hollywood, pure cinema, pure acting. There was no roll call for a genuine moment of truth when Holly Hunter was swinging a baseball bat covered in razor wire. Truth emerged from this situation. Colin walked out of his office, walked across the corridor, which T sectioned with the top of the rolling stance, he moved across the corridor. A bathroom when I had it right. A spare room when I left where a child should be born and camped and raised. Bring on characteristics of both the mother and father and then become a media co-writer or actor of some variety. And then eventually allow that bloodline to fade into obscurity. But for now, that room was as empty as the landing that claimed to just left. He was passing through more rooms, studies, a library, nook, a makeup room, 
an extended closet and other bathroom. Clint reached the window at the end of the landing outside. He could see more houses almost, Suzanne. He liked his arm. He couldn't see anyone else looking at their windows. They were all turned inwards, staring at each other themselves. Their phones, 58 their fingernails, their faces in their own mirrors, blind. It's a world boiling around them. Two American Gladiator, American Gladiator, American Gladiator, American Gladiator. The crowd stormed in their ferocity, matching that of the Roman Colosseum. But with a lot more Doritos and shit food like that, pumping around, being forced into people's mouths and eventually being forced out of their anuses. When they got home to their squalid, dry, brush-infested apartments, American Gladiator, Clint had two phone books tied to his hands. He was wearing nothing else. A set from a small string pumpkin Aaron's cock and balls. He was ready to kill someone. He was beginning to realize that he had always been ready to kill someone, that the fantasies of murder he had were expressions of not only dissatisfaction, but of the reality of the horror within all men. The announcer wasn't Max this time, it was someone else. They said things that Max wouldn't say and things that Max would say. There's a certain etiquette to gladiator or combat. It had an idea who he was fighting. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. Today was a concrete key grip special. He would be killing cast and crew from various TV shows all over town. It was him versus the key ramp of a very popular sitcom about nurses that have sex with doctors and save people from dying as a key grip. His opponent probably had an extreme ability with plugging shit and smoking and eating craft services. He knew this would be a difficult fight and was only armed with two phone book bags. The key grip came out. His assumption was right. This was going to be dangerous. The ring was large, not tank. The crowd began, screaming so loudly, their mouths echoed, others screamed in an endless encyclopedic velocity of abstract pleasure and very specific carnage. It moved fast towards the right. The key grip was strong, but he was fresh to this. He was green, green, setting up lights and complaining about orangutans, green to combat. 59 Clint got on his right side. The key grip was holding a cable that was a seemingly plugged into one, with the two lines then gripped. The key secret swung for him like a scorpion without its tail. Clint span using the phone books like whirling gears, fans around him generating a tremendous amount of ocity, spinning wildly out of control and out of reach of the cables. Pensis' trunk Colin touched a glimpse of the key grips of terror as he knew he had been outmaneuvered by a true American gladiator. Clint was behind him and swung the two books together until they were like one phone book and key grip's head. No longer like a head and no longer fulfill those functions that a man's head should like keeping the brain together or the eyeballs apart or the nose cavity free to breathe. The key grip's head exploded. The crowd was orgasmic, already erect. Men were checking, lighting, spraying thick rope everywhere. The life pigeons, guineas and fowl were relieved injected with poison. They would die within the day. But they would form a living in a venture class for the crown since I left earlier and later to chase and kill themselves. There were more to kill, more people to kill. Clint turned again. Another door opened in the massive up, then another American gladiator to face. And it was someone else from another TV show. Maybe they had a name. Maybe they didn't or a job or a backstory or their own view of the world. And something to change an opinion. Something useful to give to a loved 61. Passed down to a kid that they had knew. The only function they would be serving in this story was another grisly reminder that it was them. I American gladiator that nobody fun aimants. Clint charged. His opponent was carrying a trident most covered in VHS tapes and stamped the trident with his phone book, lodging under the three prongs. For swinging his other hand, his left hand blinded the man and using that same hand, the left hand. It repeated the same motion again and again. Blinding, then removing smell and sound. Then the ability to French cars, 
Then swallow them, breathe. Let's try on some. He had just done it again. He was the best in the business. The announcer began chattering away like his wife on the phone. And you're in this chapter. Here they come. Here they come. Colin was slightly aware that today's American gladiatorial combat was slightly different from the rest today with child actions is about as came out from the same deal as the last one. Shocking claim. One of them stamped him in the leg with a boom pole. The two small switchblades were wearing gold swastika necklaces. The Kamikaze twins, Clint recognized them from other at the Science of American Gladiator. King could see his life flashing before his eyes. Damn, he thought, what a fucking horrific life I had. Fuck, yeah. And then he picked up the trident and killed the first child. He was a child actor. And so it all went directly to hell. And people only mentioned him in jokes and in YouTube videos talking, music played. And there were subtitles from articles online made by Indian men, the chemicals. These twins were smart, slightly harder to deal with. Clint was already injured, so he picked one of them up and threw one against the wall of the massive American gladiator, took the child, hit him with such speed that all the breath was knocked out of him. He was stunned, stunned by the cruelty of man. And then Clint kicked his fucking head in and turned his attention 61 to the last child actor that pissed himself and began walking away. Oh, thanks. And Clint and Tara, Clint picked up the unused switchblade. From the kamikaze twin that was now twitching and spewing a peculiar red liquid all over the floor. What a mess. That's easy for you. The knife deep into the chest of the remaining boy, just below the swastika, just above the heart, severing so many little wires. The boy could feel cold steel before an instant. Before there wasn't enough oxygen in his brain to remember the way his mother lips felt as I kissed him on the head for days at school when it was so cold and the chap lips and the gray spinning sky and blackness swallowing blackness and the strange feeling of loss. The crowd went ballistic with the growing effigies. Onto the pitch, it went into the center of the field and performed a small ritual of opening a can of American Gladiator Cool Cola and drinking it, smacking his lips. Clint sand, smooth, smooth as the dickens, and then went back to the door that he came out of one more fighter. The narrator said, one more fighter. Clint turned. They were chanting in one more fighter, one more fighter. On the other side of the octagon was one more fighter. Clint coconuts the way they moved Jay. They couldn't place exactly who they were. 62 They were covered from head to toe in pages of the novelization of Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. A good read. Clint knew it well. Clint was unarmed. He was injured. And as well as being clothed. Such. Oh, well-rounded novelization of a classic film, the attacker also had a morning star, a ball with a series of spikes on it, connected with chain to a tube. They were grasping at both ends. They began sidling towards each other. Clint exhausted his opponent. Strange day, weak-looking strange, Nampara Hansen. They clashed, the morning star swung. Up above, the attackers had a sweeping arching motion like a clunk sideways. Clint spun out that way. Fambul banks were no longer in his hands. And this is far less dramatic as well. His leg was buggered. That bastard little kid can't. He thought I can use the kid, baited the attacker over to other children, lay bleeding. The attacker swung the morning star again, and this time it hit one of the children's chattering corpses and stunk. The attacker let go. She let go. Clinton moved towards her fast. His initial goal was to quickly kill this person. But instead he pulled a page from her thanks. Is the page where Anna King Kill Can't Do Care by choking its head off with two lines. Sippos. It was Clint's wife's thanks under the well, not her face, someone else's face, but it was Clinton's wife under there somewhere deep down. It was Clinton's wife. She pushed him back as he hollowed out in shock. This fantastical twist in the tale of his life. My God, he said, my God, what have I done? 
What have I done? His wife said, Nothing. I'm bent down and I'm pickled. The morning star from the child's now still haunts. With a small amount of blood in her hands from the operation, she smeared her face to face someone else's face, not her face, a move towards Clint again. We were having the morning star or up to a terrifying, horrific speed. Clint torched again, barely missing the tank. Morning star. Honey, I'm here to kill you. She said, oh, my god, I thought Clinton. What have I done? What have I 63 done? She swung again and again. She was getting tired. She was a housewife on Beverly Hills. She'd never swung anything before. She'd never been golfing. She got tired eventually. Clint choked her to death. She tried biting, gnashing and putting your hands behind her back like she was trying to touch his haunches while he was making love to her or his eyes out. Plus, she couldn't. And she died very quickly, put in tremendous, tremendous pain. Instead, kicking both of his legs out from under her like a frunk, he moved his body away and stood. The crowd was noisy, was bellowing and then became quiet. What if you're wrong? Clint said the crowd was definitely quiet. You could hear puberty strikes some of the children. At this moment, it was so quiet. What if you're wrong? What if you're all wrong? What if it's not impossible? What if you're wrong? What if this dream factory? Well, what if you're wrong about it? Tell me what they feel wrong. He turns arms outstretched oding on people to give him something, give them an answer over layering comment, anything that they remain deathly silent as they watch the man that champion. What if you're wrong? Ken said again. What if you're wrong? What if I'm right? Well, if you're all wrong and I'm right. There was silence as Clint started walking back to the door. He had left. The narrator put the microphone to their lips again, causing a slight tickle of distortion over the many speakers in the Great Hall of Fame. 64 But they said nothing. Clint was almost at the door. But just before he went through, he turned back and felt as if every I would just to looking back at him when I show wrong. He said, well, if you're fucking wrong, this isn't it. This isn't beautiful or truthful. Perfect. This is just shit. What if we've all just done this for nothing? What if this is a what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? We will. Believing this thing. Right. What if it's not? What if it's wrong when for every last part of you knows it's wrong? You say it's right, even though you know it's wrong. What if I'm wrong? What if I chose poorly and made bad decisions? If I'm wrong, then walked. And the black enveloped him and who is in the long tunnel leading back to his mansion, back deep into the parts of L.A. where no one without a billion dollars can live comfortably for more than a day? The house was empty. It had always felt empty. But now it was really empty. Clint could ring bells and push buttons and mates and lawyers and police officers would come in. Clan really felt, well, it was empty this time, there was normally a sense that someone else was here. His wife, his full probably his wife that he had killed. She normally made the place feel a lot safer, even though she was only really loud and busy when she was screaming and yelling and smashing Clint's ex-wife. He thought, my ex-wife, not my current wife. I don't have a current wife. The party at Clint's house was going to start the round 4 a.m., didn't really understand why it was happening and who arranged it, what the particulars of the event would be. But somehow there had been a hurdy-gurdy of occurrences that forced a house party Clint's empty house sooner rather than later. Clint didn't know he was going to be there, but he didn't feel apprehension or joy. Just a sense that they would be chips and lots of people cavorting, saying lots and lots of words, but very few things. The time rolled around. 65 inevitably, people were arriving. Many looks had come and gone. No one dressed as David Letterman anymore. No one dressed like anyone anymore. They were dressed as monsters, teaming up on monsters. Lost boys and girls with long teeth and blue felt too far. 
They snickered and chuckled. That's Clint, one that the party. And it's sort of alligator costume with a naiveness to it. It made it seem more like the costume a boy would wear if he'd been abducted by alligators and was forced to live amongst them and became one of them and used what he had learned with the alligator people to teach lessons to mankind. There was a woman at the party. She was attractive. And from Norway she was attractive in foreign. Both of these things were valuable in Los Angeles, California. She was attractive for one and young. And she didn't have any plastic in her face. Not yet. She was tall, but not too tall. And all of those things were valuable. And Clint wanted all of them. They were on a date a day or two later. I didn't think you would ask me out. She said you didn't say anything to me at the party. That's because Clint didn't say anything to her at the party. He saw how this thing goes deep into his drink. An old-fashioned two fuzzy dice, one hanging in and one out of the glass. He did his fingers in and pulled them out, sucked on them. Vivaciously like a homeless man would owe a sex predator or a rapist. She smiled, turning her face very slightly in a sort of come and fuck me way. Clint then moved his head slowly to the left like a security camera lacking any sort of human 66 control. Auto man, a dramatory ass lay patrolling the room, never returning to her for the rest of the night. You just... Well, I just didn't think you would call me. I guess I didn't even know you had my number. I have everyone's number, said Clint. I work for the FBI. I've been working for them for years. They made me a star so I can infiltrate this thing. But it all fell apart. And now I'm an American gladiator. And so long people recognize me in the street till this diner. Like that woman over there staring at me deeply. Like I have something to give her a secret trade. Like I have her some hostage so long she keeps staring at me. I'm underwater water and I can move in ways mysterious to the people on the dry land above. Like you like me right now. It could change for you, too. You become special like me. We could be special together. She said she liked the way he was talking to her. Like an insane person. Like a homeless man or a sex predator. Online messaging children endlessly with dark, evil fantasies. I have a question. Yeah, said Clint in a cool John Wayne kind of way. Didn't you kill your last wife in a big arena, Clint? One of his legs up in the booth? Yeah, I did. I'm the American gladiator. She smiled, looking up at the same time as she smiled like it was rehearsed for a movie. Clint wanted this woman to cry at his funeral and to help his son pick out what suit he would wear with dead a base abusive father. PJ says he should wear this Rashid in a box. Grotesque and hated by the people that once loved him. What do you say? Says Clint. Shall we get out of here? Yeah. She says, let's blow this joint. They get up. The priest is confused. The service isn't even halfway over. And her husband is standing. With another strangely attractive Norwegian wound. The priest even at this distance and in this dangerous situation while doing his job, you can tell that she is very valuable to possess in Los Angeles, California, could you, um? He is interrupted by their rudeness as they 67 shuffle down the line and people kind of shift back in their seats and move their legs in without really moving. As a mob show of accommodation, to the abrupt accent, along with a slight tattering Quinn's dead wife, mother and her father and a few husbands and whatever else. Well, the family is formed by the detritus of a successful man breaking up with an equally successful woman. Well, I'll continue then, says the priest. His wife always loved drinking Coca-Cola. They leave the church and we can do to see that long rectangular streets never ascending or descending in height. As they move, they go through areas that are claimed by different ethnicities, past palm trees and dirt and security cards left in the street. 7-Eleven is locked up corner stores. They see people. They've decided to not become movie stars and instead to simply live by the side of the road.
These people I refer to as politicians and they live in tents and sell heroin to each other and perform unspeakable sex acts for very little. People, even Clint, look at them and feel disgust. And somewhere there is the acknowledgement that they could be them, that they could so easily sink and become at the same pump, stop becoming in many ways, Clint, it stopped coming. He was traveling through the street blocks with this girl. And parts of him were falling off like a shitty car in a cross-country escapade. A bull and a bumper. He was shedding lands. There was a funeral somewhere for a woman. He had done something with a ritual, something that other people knew about. It wasn't a secret. It was public. It was in books. It was written in magazines and on pictures. And people speculated about it. And they took pictures of him when he went into the sea. And people commented, experts commented. But that was falling off of him, though. Where do you think? Well, Clint says to the Norwegian girl. I don't know. She says, I'm lost. I'm from Norway. I live in Oslo. Clint smiles through his eyes, a fallen out, his tongue and lips around the pavement, 68 smoldering like dog shit. Let's go back to our house. Let's get married. Clint says, what? Clint doesn't really say this because Clint just skin now being held up by the starch in the suit that his dead wife bought for him. Casey Haver had to get her funeral. The irony being, she never assumed it would be her own funeral. She thought she would outlive Clint for a long period of time and she would remarry or at least have a love affair with someone that would really fill her in, if you'd know what I am saying. The Norwegian girl let out a noise, and grabbed Clint, squeezing him, letting air out of his mouth as he was just inflated. I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to. She said, Clint thought that this was sweet and that he couldn't wait to ruin things with such a beautiful woman. And he didn't know how he could possibly cheat on someone so pure and so giving. He was sure that he could find a way. After all, he was the American gladiator. Clint is on the phone and he is talking to Max. He's trying to arrange his wedding with a Norwegian girl. He's being expressive and moving his hands and touching his neck and looking wistfully at his Norwegian soon-to-be wife. In the kitchen, making some jello or jelly, however, merit officials say it. Max, you've got to come, he says down the phone line. The phone is not plugged in and it's simply a problem. You've got to do this for me, Max. Clint is waiting for card. He's waiting for direction. He doesn't know how to speak to his old friend. He hasn't spoken to in months, maybe years. He hasn't gone that deep with the character. His Norwegian wife is continuing to make the GELO naturalistically. She eventually calls Clint over. And Clint being a professional, does not look up at the camera and walks over to the kitchen after pretending to hang up on his longtime friend, Max, so, baby doll, my Norwegian sweetheart, what are you up to? I'm making hello, she says in a kind of Norwegian accent that sounds more like the international posh girl voice emanating from a Barbie with a pull string. 69 looks delicious, princess. I know we had it for dinner yesterday, but I just love jelly so much, Clint nods in the affirmative. He understands at this point during Clint's life, Clint became quite dulcet and reclusive and performed simple actions like nodding in the affirmative rather than putting a nice inflection to his voice and telling someone they'd done a good job or meant something to him. Word genius that he loved them or he didn't love them. Clint also hated jelly. But he knew that Clint always that jelly and he would have to do if the camera panned in close. Clint moved in behind his Norwegian girlfriend, soon to be wife, in the way that people do in TV shows and the seemingly recreate in real life like a child performing a suplex. A younger boy breaking his spine, causing permanent nerve damage that he would never recover from based on a wrestling show. Clinton moved behind his Norwegian soon to be wife, pressed his groin against her buttocks and put his arms around her waist as she did something in the sink with a jello. Clint was surprised to see that she was actually making hello. Mold wasn't empty.
thought of all the other molds filled with jelly that must surely be thrown away from just each single take and how wasteful this was, but also how truthful this was almost like it was really happening to him. He could talk about this in all the press interviews, we threw away this amount of jello. That's how important this film was to us. What TV show or 70 whatever they was that they were filled with those big black cameras. He could never quite see. Looks good, honey. Just got off the blower with maps. Big stuff coming up. Big stuff. It's Norwegian. Soon to be wife turned to him. She was weighing someone else's face. They kissed Clint, moved his hands and they retreated upstairs. This Norwegian, soon to be wife, put the jelly in the fridge, which was so large and so American. It was like a Cadillac or a flag or a big gulp. It looked like it was from a different planet. It was so eminently beautiful. So gluttonous. Yet without any aspirations, to be fair, to a different class. Clint thought about how this fridge, well, it was open and closed, let out a jet. Cool. And how production must have set up some sort of icebox or contraption that pumped out this cooler to simulate what? Fridge really does. When it's too warm, it's pumped open and closed in such a way. Clint was mesmerized by the craft of filmmaking yet again. He doesn't know how he ever quit. Clint feels like telling her but knows if he does. We're in this tank and the tank's been going on for five months now. That's a lot of film to burn just to acknowledge the handiwork of a few tradesmen. They go upstairs on the bed of several boxes filled with thanks as his Norwegian wife trying on different faces while Clint builds and maintains an attraction. They eventually settle on a murder case from South Central. She had a thanks for moved and donated the help for victims fund. It was a very progressive act, but they were about to engage and Clint knew this would be raved about in their reviews. When those black huge cameras finally reached the end of their seemingly endless reels of film and those reels were sped out and chopped up and pasted together into a marvelous picture about love life. And the American 71 dream that he was living right now with its very exclusive girlfriend, which he assumed would soon become his wife. When it was over, Clint pinched the ghoulish special effects that come out from his penis. He couldn't believe how great the best boy's work must be been the special effects, the creature effects, even the ADR and the moans. He was so happy to be in a production of Caliper. He wondered who the director was again but couldn't quite place him, couldn't quite see him when he looked out of the room where he stood and ran. I was in the open circular courtyard of their house, still naked with a pleasant evening breeze. Turning the protoplasm to one of the assistants had smeared over his stomach. He went towards the security gate and clambered over it. Where were they? Where was the truck? Where was he? Clint kept walking his feet, didn't feel Sawyer began humming. He walked further. He was walking past more homes identical to his. He might have walked past his own home for all he knew. They all look the same. They're all probably made out of the same sort of stuff. And of chipboard and plaster only up for a few months or maybe longer necessary to shoot whatever they were shooting. What's it called? Where was his Norwegian wife? Why weren't they doing American Gladiator anymore? Clint's feet began to tingle. He would be developing blisters now that would take weeks to recover. He was pattering along the street faster now. No one won't. In Los Angeles. But Clinton Clint was an actor. He was searching for truth. Clint walked in Los Angeles. He walked down the mountain. His Norwegian wife was developing a small version of Clint in her belly. The creature designers thought it would be neat if the version of Clint started off really small. Like a grain of rice and then a bean and then more fruits until it was the size of K-L-I-N, maybe even slightly taller. 72 because of that latent Norwegian DNA, I suppose Clinton kept walking. He was looking around. He didn't see any booms, any running crew, any tell land or screen land, whatever they call it, where they put all those screens in that tent. And people leer over his glistening.
celluloid faith as it mimics an orgasm into its future by. Couldn't remember where his wife had been buried. Either one, the real one or the one in this thing, or whether the same were they. This is a bio of his real life starring himself. There was no bus stops. There was no public transport. Clint stopped where he was standing. It was back to his house. The security guard and let him leave. Let him back in. And Clint entered. The only difference was internal and the thin layer of skin at the bottom of his feet that now became a meaty war extension of a certain awareness that Clinton had. That something was deeply wrong. If something was rotten, there something was growing. Had been growing. Clint returned to bed. His Norwegian wife didn't notice his feet. Assumed he had been doing something repugnant. Something disgusting and actually been looking in the mirror. His severely engorged penis after sex or calling another woman sharing his penis out the window to passers-by or paparazzi or destroying parts of plants in the house. As Clint sometimes did, not knowing he was searching for microphones. Where were you, honey? It's Norwegian. Soon to be wife said. I was getting this feeling, Clint said. Paul pulled out a wedding ring with a diamond dinner. I want to make you my wife, and I want to marry you. I love you so much, she didn't know what to say. She was so shocked. Clint, I... I love you. I love you so much, she put the wedding ring on. In a bizarre reverse of ice exercise of the clumpy quarters. They just had since the beginning to fill with clear white fluid separating its damaged feet so far, the layer of skin below blistering. 73 blistering all over, causing him to walk like a cripple for a number of days. The wedding was planned. I love it, I love it, she said, sitting up in bed. The silken cheeks. Defiling. Revealing breasts in the stomach. That would seem to form to make room or whatever organizational shifts take place in a woman's stomach before she gives birth to the baby of a movie star. She obviously loved the ring. Her heart rate had increased to the point where it was scientifically undeniable. The shoe had gained happiness from this financial transaction and this dumping of DNA they couldn't have just performed. Couldn't begin to imagine a noose descending from the sky like their sex Mackinder. He was not entertained or informed on film or performance any more than anyone in California is more than the fetish and the performance aspect of the performance. Well, you should say about it that he knew about death, ex machina, about the assurances off the stage, the mechanisms to perform miracles that would have solved the plot. The angel descending from the heavens. How old stories were comedies or tragedies or both and nothing else, and how one day a rope could descend from the sky and pick him up and take him somewhere else. Well, Alexis, the people who survived in the dry world above him would never understand. She loved it so much, she hugged Clint. She even tapped his penis to see if it was working, which it was then. Clinton was in shell shock, like a World War II infantryman. Had just seen several have. His platoon mates die in front of him in a mortar shot, but not quite palatable. It's funny 74 how things are so different for different people in different times. Clint thought that this would make a great idea for a film, that he could probably get it made if American Gladiator was still going on or wasn't going on. He couldn't quite remember. He didn't think he could survive another fight. He remembered killing his wife in the rain. How miserable he felt. Not really caring, but really feeling anything, but feeling so bad about it. Being selfish with anything bad about it, feeling like he could make something with a pain, like he could model it in clang, like an irate dirty prison protest being turned to a modern art exhibit. Many years later in an LA gallery, the smell of human chant was thinking about this. This is the unsigned from Norway, from Oslo. Kissed him passionately on the lips, moved to knee in between his legs. Wondered why his feet would do if he hung himself, if there were two inch like he was coming, if they would go straight or bend or his toes would fall, like maybe a doctor would participate to tingle, to show that he could still move them. He's moving his feet. 
Doctor, he has made it. He's not paralyzed. That sort of might am. He couldn't get out of his head the way they would find his body. How embarrassing it would be, and the only right way would be to be preventing a murder or some sort of horrific terrorist attack. That's the only acceptable way. Began whispering into his fiancée there. I work for the FBI, says Clint. She stiffened. Suddenly I worked for the FBI. She began smiling. She talked to him for a while. And he said expletives back eventually. She said that they should go to the cinema that they should see near. Apparently, the American gladiator stage of American history. It was over and there was now a two-day colonizing period for a celebrity in murdering any other living human being. Excluding a child. They went and saw a film and returned home, and their house was bright and light in the sky outside those pink. End of chapter. They're not picking the show up. God damn it, they're just not picking it up. It was in a full boner 75 rage. Absolutely mental. They're not fucking picking it up. I don't understand. They're not picking Abbo. Max. Well, sitting at the desk with five other people who had strikingly similar features to Max, they were all muttering like members of a card game office. Someone had just pulled out the ace of monkey dobbing and they were wondering if they should let him win or separate his balls from his body. They were writers. It's new show. It was a full-blown Hollywood star. An actor. He should be able to get a show made. It shouldn't be this hard. They were making it this odd for him for some reason because there's something he did of something he said at a party or something else. Or maybe the fact that Jellybean inside of his Norwegian now wife, stomach grown to the size of a grapefruit or some other fruit. They're not picking my goddamn show up. I have no idea why. What did I do? Tell me you've got to fix if you've got to fix this. They're not picking up my show. The writers were in turmoil. They didn't know what to do. They were in picking the show up. Clint was right. They were in picking his show on. One of his writers turned to Clinton, said it's just not honest. It's just not truthful. Max is right. You're in a show about someone who's not you. And I think it's time that we tell your story. Clint, you've lived such an immaculate life. This time for you to tell it. Your talk show performance is a laugh. Across the nation, the writers count post-it notes the size of a three pages. They were massively expensive and they took out fresh sharpies that were cleared out every week, costing at least $50. This gaudy expense made the right feel like Godzi along with a free coffee. Mark Colvin just stopped speaking. Clint, tell us about your life. Max was in turmoil. They were older now. Clinton met on different sides of the room. They still 76 haven't spoken to each other. That shot the pilot and then cost Max $125 million. And it was shit that made no fucking sense. It was so fucking shit. These writers were fucking idiots. Max was a loser. Max beaches his wife. Max was going down. Clint had a 19-year-old wife. No career. And people didn't like him cause he killed Robert De Niro. And there was going to be a new meet the Fockers and they had a cast. John Malkovich as the dad because of the brutal homicide of everyone's favorite Bobby. Okay. Okay says Clement. Get me a tea. No, fuck that. Get me a hot coffee making black. Black like my soul. The right is. We're impatient. They were ready to consume this fucker's very essence and transform it into a three-act structure like Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey Hero with a Thousand Faces. It was going to be spectacular. It was going to earn them an Emmy's. Clint stretched back in his plastic chair with metal legs. I was a boy in Brooklyn. Small town. One of my uncles barely related to me, went to the bakery. Well, I say worked at a bakery. He was more of a gangster. There is more of a gangster everywhere. He ran the block. I barely knew it at the time, but I could tell something was different about him. Different than my dad or my ma.
I mean, Ma, my people are this uncle. He can make things happen. He can move things with his mind. He could make people sob and go down on one knee. He can make weddings happen. He could kill people. He could turn people religious. He could set fire to buildings with a word. I started working for him. Small stuff to begin with. Having sex with politicians. Throwing Molotov cocktails into helicopters as they took up from airports, causing them to crash in massive epic fireballs. I even shot the Irish president that we had. Nixon, no Kennedy. Kennedy and his bank brother to shame. I didn't get that bitch wife. I met someone else, too. He was my best friend. We were young. He was shorter than me. And I had thick black hair. We became criminals wanting up out of town. 77 eventually, my uncle turned the song to the big boys. The family, the family let us. Do more crimes than get more respect. All across town. Vengeance. I met someone else and we started doing more stuff. Criminal stuff, you know, criminals do. Eventually, we went on a date that I didn't want to go on. And I married that girl because she was rude in a parking lot to me. And then, my first friend that I met, became enemies with a mob because of a murder he did. And he was killed. My best friend became suspicious of me as he was close. Blood relation to the mob than I was, and he had a feeling that I might betray him, which was bullshit. I never would betray him. But his suspicion made me need to betray him to protect myself. So I did. I squirreled a man. I put him away. And I went to live in protection somewhere home, somewhere in Florida. That's my life story. That's me. That's fucking Clinton standing in front of you. Most of the writers had left the room. Some of them that remained looked at him with dismay or disgust in their eyes. They were disappointed at the story. He had told the lies that to street. The inability to tell the truth. We'll know who he was. All these things are valid in L.A. Authenticity, realism, truth, plastic tense, arse kissing, dick staying hard being moral, being a good person, being driven. What was Clint? Clint left the building. Yep. Glass doors with metal handles, most secretaries. So beautiful. He could imagine marrying them and leaving his wife pregnant, crying for them for a massive settlement that would cause long-term damage and eventually destroy their relationship. Clint left the production office, Max, Max, Max Productions. He knew that it wouldn't be there for longer. He knew that he had just destroyed this project. Was Max's last project his best friend? We invited him in the second day. He was lost in Los Angeles. Would never. Max, thank you. A voice came over, a passing cars or idea. The headless man was standing there smiling in a way that Max. It was the FBI agent. Hey, dude, it's you, Max, it's me, Max, said the FBI agent. You mean Clinton? Oh, yeah, I do. I guess I'm... I-78 guess my allies aren't so good. Tell you something, when you see Max around, I think. Yeah, I see him around. You should go and see him. It's almost the end. Clint don't want it to be the end of just a fiasco. A new wife. She's pregnant. I think. I came inside of it. She's probably pregnant. The baby is probably the size of a grapefruit or some other fruit at this point in time. A car stopped. His window rolled down. Clint, it's time for you to see Max again. What does this mean? It's almost over. I don't want it to be up to you. Clint. Get in. The driver opened the door by leaning over the middle part of the car and the passenger seat and pushing the car door open. Clements did. Still, for a second before entering the car, the FBI agent then got him behind him. You know, Clinton, when I saw you were green, not green anymore. You know that, Danny, I guess I do. As Clint. Well, says the agent. When you're green, 
You get caught. You heal over and you keep growing. Well, those cuts, they turn you into someone else. But when you're on the way, you are now doing the things you're doing. You don't grow back. You you just start dying. That's the benefit of being green. Clint didn't want to be in this car anymore. He imagined the cameras flaming out and losing the car on the highway. Just another car in an endless fitting Clinton. You know, this place is full of dreams, Danny. Clint perked up. Yeah. The city of dreams. Clint knew this because he wasn't green anymore. They had been in the city almost his entire life now. He was a Reeds general, not remembering the boy in the town that he grew up in or what clean water tastes like or ogling women with good morals looked like anymore. Apart from a disgusting statistic after voting had come in. You know, Clint, this is the city of dreams. Repeated the CIA, FBI agent in the backseat of the car with no head speaking through the car's radio system. This is the city of dreams with the city of dreams. Nightmares, terrible, terrible nightmares. K-L-I-N all this stuff, all these dreams, these million American dreams, millions of them. Everyone here dreaming them up at night, 79 scheming the small, keeping them down like a thick fucking ozone layer of custard that people can step on. It's so fucking thick, Clint, they keep the nightmare then and the nightmares become real to Clint. The nightmares become just as real as the dreams. Those eerie, dreamy picture screens that you see sometimes, Clint and the movie theaters where it's dark and people smoke and masturbate and make out and seeps behind you, but you can still hear their mouth. Sounds as some fucking cartoon character learns the meaning of friendship or some bullshit like that. Those dreams generate nightmares. Clint, you're in one of those nightmares right now. You've been one one those nightmares from the very beginning of this. That's what the dream is, Clint. It's a fucking nightmare. Clint was pretty spaced out by all this crazy quacking. Quinn was on a cleanse, is a cool older guy in Los Angeles, California, past his prime. What happened to your head since Clinton, the FBI agent, looks at Clinton, his body looks at Clinton, his neck turns press and his missing. My hands lying in the LA River. A rat ate my eyes out a couple of days after we left it. They're clean. You can lose your head, too, buddy, do. Any idea where FBI, Stan is love, the Federal Bureau of Investigations says Clinton, the person driving the car, looked over once naked image mixture between Snickers and the N-word, word sort of candy ass and word of a facial expression. Clint, I want you to get out. I want you to get my head for me. I don't understand. It's there. We're back. And we're a few blocks from where I found you. Decades ago, Clint, decades ago. You owe me. Now get out. Clint got out. The radio was quiet. The guy in the passenger seat changed it over to another channel and it was playing some bongo bongo music. Clint stumbled across a grassy knoll. Grass was so deformed and black and yellow. It was like the pubic hair of a dead or Clint clambered over a concrete embankment and slid down to the sludge of the LA River. It was almost a torrent. It was unbearable. Clint was down to his knees in the fucking 80 sludge and March barely pushing through. He could see lumps. He pushed his hands into them, but they switched in beneath his hands like tit implants. His first wife and assumedly at some point his second wife would get in actuality here in the LA River. They were human shit. Clint gets his marching through. He could see more lumps. He grabbed he pulled up. It was the head of the FBI agent. Clint turned around again, began walking. But he could feel fingers clay or ring at his feet. Stopping him. Eventually, one of them got enough of a harness into his leather loafers with gold buttons, of course. He wasn't wearing socks. It was a movie star, for fuck's sake. Pulled off one of his brogues and start exploring. It has been pulling blood. Human shit. Is instantly infecting the wound. He began screaming holding the head above his head arm's length as the head became screaming to Clint. Clint, get me out of here. Get me out of here. 
I'm in pain. I'm in such pain clinic. Get me out. I'm dying. He pulled and pushed his own body out of the LA River onto the concrete bank. He didn't stop. He knew he needed to get back to the car. He staggered back the embankment, looked like nothing now just grass. He stumbled back into the passenger seat and sat down. The FBI agent picked up his hand and placed it onto his shoulders and kept his hands just by his ears, holding it in place. The bunga bunga is it was quiet and the passenger turned it down. If Clinton entered, the FBI agent kept spitting out chinton piss and decay from his mouth. Take me to Max's house. Clinton says, I'm fine. I'm fine. They're driving down the highway. Clint doesn't feel anything about a highway. He looks at the man driving the car. He's completely and utterly expressionless, like a man watching your Ricky Yovanka comedy. Can I see my wife? Which one says the FBI agent at the bank, the one you killed? Well, this one, the one that you haven't even named yet. She's got a name. Georgie does. She's got a lot too. A family, a family tree. Became quiet as they drove back up the mountain. He could feel the credits. Tickling the 81 music swell and the car chortle up the mountain path where the man whose company had just destroyed the life he had in some part contributed to massively and also destroyed in its entirety, presided. The FBI agent in the back of the car leaned forward, Clint, it stands for friends, buddy, it's instanted. I'm an agent of that. We will. I just wanted to help you out, man, because you're my friend and I'm your buddy. And now it's time for you to get out. It was they were at Max's house. Palin opened the car door and shut up. Instead, as the car drove away, again, Clint wasn't educated or a fan of literature or acting opposed to the L.A. sense of truth and power and knowledge through creation and general search team spirituality in S.H.U.N.G. form shui and energy fields and all this crystal shit. But Clinton looked down at his right hand because that's what a character did in Jack London's White Fang. They looked down at their right hand and they saw the wires and the muscles. They saw how they all interconnected, how beautiful they were and how complicated they were and how much joy and love and expression they brought to the world and how he was gifted with such a complex machine to do so much with. And Clinton knew that he had wasted them here to eat them to jerk off his cock, to give the middle finger to children and say, quote, the right to make that sort of wanking off fine. The people over the street, two drivers over crosswalks to pet bunny rabbits or stroke dogs or pinch their ears. Well, home to his wife, hair back as she functions calm. They seem to be designed to use a piano or something. Clint looked at his hand, looked at his hands. They were still covered in a bit of rancid you from the LA River. He stunk. He can't smell it anymore. His senses were beginning to fade to black. His hands full. What could he have used them for? It would have been worthwhile. He remember telling that Norwegian girl as they walked on one line from the drive to the house. If they had used an external drive you couldn't bear ping entered past at gates. Telling her that he valued his hand so much because of this Jack London novel he never read called 82 White Fang and how truthful that felt in the moment, but in the abstract. Now, in this moment that he was facing the wolves underneath that tree, the harpsichord of cables in his hand, the miles of veins and arteries and bone fragments and knuckles and cartilages and all the other stuff, just seemed too strange, attached to his brain. Why were they? He never had an idea. Complicated enough to use them fully. They trembled so much now that he couldn't work with them. Did they ever make with them? He never used them. He never used his vocal cords properly. He used them to trick people into thinking he was feeling things. He began walking towards the gate and opened it. One of the hands. He closed the gate behind him and walked into Max's house. Max was standing there wearing a silken robe. Like Max, not like the king of Egypt, took Prussia or a noble prince from a foreign land like Max. Like no one else where I can.
No one else could wear it with its silken hem wording up against his hairy legs. He was holding another glass. This time it was black. Come in, my friend. Come in. I had an inkling you would be coming in. Clint, smile. It's been too long. Last time I was here, I killed Robert Nero. I know. I know. I know, said Max. I'm sorry about that. I just had to do it. You know, I needed to start American Gladiator. I thought it was gonna save the industry. I thought it was gonna save you. I was really excited about it. No problem. No problems. Clinton, I understand these things. I know these things. Difficult for people to getting by. This town's difficult. Max turned on the ball of one of his feet. Yeah, this town is difficult. They smiled. They weren't really people anymore. There was something else. Clint could almost see a shot that zoomed out from the top of his head. Well, moving out from the back of his eyes like the camera was viewing through his eyes, shooting out and going across the town to where his wife lay. She is with someone else. It didn't really matter. She was only pregnant with his child. His child, she his wife, they all became strange words to him. His hands felt funny. He became aware of them. You become aware his 83 feet and his skin attached to his head. Max picked up a vase and threw it for a huge plate glass window. It smashed on the floor and skidded until it finally hit the glass balustrade that separated his human dwelling from a plunge so deep and so inevitable. It was death itself. It was the flat ground of the LA basin where they were the fans and the bees and the seeds, not the aids on the mountain, like drink like Max and Clint. Max picked up a small metal chariot and gave it to Clint. Clint kept holding it. Max told Clint that when he saw him, he had a feeling about him. He was special that he was going to bring balance to Hollywood, not destroy it. He threw a replica baseball and it hit just the top of the glass balustrade, causing no damage. I need you to sit, Max, I need something Clint threw the chariot, smashing another window and destroying the balustrade. It shattered instantaneously like an ego would. Yeah. Max, through another piece of memorabilia came through a cushion. Max threw a lampshade in the shape of Albie Hatpins, breasts, the anus. It fluttered but maintained the velocity and wafted over the balcony. More was thrown a shaver, some toothpaste, a deodorant in the shape of a phallus. Some tripods used for home pornography. Some video cameras, some shoes were emptied from the closet and thrown more stuff, a whole couch. They were helping each other now. The bar tiles from the floor and the ceiling, the lampshades, all of them now. This time, not the novelty ones. Those cases clean through shoes. The glass from the broken windows cut into the feet and called Dick Bloody Streets to be pumped out onto the other way as immaculately clean floor. The house was almost empty. The tube was empty. Squeezed like toothpaste. Everything had been vomited out. Max smiled. Max smiled. Big Max and Salter's friend, his own only friend. The only person you have to know who gave them the brink. You let him be him. Who Max resented more than anyone else. He was his brother. But in some twisted way that Max knew could never be his real brother. They weren't blonde. They were enemies. 84 but they couldn't figure out what their problem was. They couldn't figure out how they interconnected or how they talked to each other properly, like two human beings. They were doing business with each other, but never making more money than each other. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure out the complexity of the situation they were in. America the Beautiful Max said it's America the Beautiful. The camera leaves the two shot and swoops down. The balcony hitting 90 degrees. Facing down, shooting towards the basin below the house, sharing the vomitous detritus. The house had exited trophies movie posters, Oscars and Golden Globes. Stuff related to American Gladiator and other stuff related to conventional movies where the only damage done was the female movie star thought that were reverently raped or whatever. 
It's America the Beautiful, said Max. Look at it. Max moved his feet on the floor as not to step directly in the glass, and so Clint. They were skating in a weird kind of which holistic way towards the edge of the balcony. They were so eager to see it. Look, says Max, it's America. They're beautiful. It's imperative that fucking beautiful. We made it. There was trash sticking out from the sandy hilltop, panning all the way down to the flatbed of the river where the city was built. Maybe it was a prehistoric ocean. Maybe God made it to track people who had dreams and nightmares. The conflict rotted into a city that was always one day of the year. It's America, the beautiful. Look at it. The sky was such a stinging pink and blue. Tornado. It was like Colgate toothpaste. It was too beautiful to behold. The multicolor strands and the minty freshness of the night. Clinton looked at Max as Max smiled, smiled like Max had never smiled before. He'd thrown his glass. He was still wearing that silken robe like only Max could ever wear. The ant said, Clint Max put his finger up. That's why you're not green anymore, Clint, you're a thinker. You're an L.A. boy like me. 85 they ran back into the house. There was art all over the walls, pictures of women descending staircases nude, but drinking Pepsi Cola and all the other type of nonsense shit that people in L.A. would buy and put onto their rich walls. And that to be the home, they were throwing it to canvases and cracking as the wind struck them, as they fluttered down not turning into paper airplanes, but turning into the rotund corpses of corporate art, slammed down into the slag heap below their home. America the fucking beautiful. This is it. Max said it. Said it. It's America. The fucking beautiful. Max's wife, miles away, turned over in bed. Max's wife was in a grave somewhere. She was dead. Max's mother and father were very proud of him, but didn't speak to him anymore. Neither did no one in his hometown. They weren't proud of him. They were kind of resentful. They didn't know him very well. He didn't know himself very well. America the beautiful, said Max, grinning with something deep behind his eyes. Looked back at Max. His silk robe was dark and as the sun set. It was much darker. The trash from that house had been ejaculatory released. America the beautiful said Clint. A thief stepped over the balcony. Turtling. Hurtling towards the flattened city in the world so flat, it must have been a prehistoric river or an ocean or somewhere. God had made for this purpose no other purpose. It was too flat in the mountains around it to perfect. They trapped it all in there made it hard to breathe. They kept the smoke in the straight streets and the poor blacks shooting each other and wearing expensive white sneakers and turtle wind buffeted him for milliseconds or maybe seconds. Time works differently some 